Right. We shall start. Called yet? No. Six minutes to go yet, Control. Please speak up, please. Uh, city removers here. I believe you wanted an estimate. You're always welcome. You did exactly what I told you, talk to nobody. Remember, Jim, trust no one, no one. You worked me alone. I'm sorry, there's no vodka. I didn't expect any. I've got a job for you. Familiar territory, Czechoslovakia. Perhaps a bit too familiar. Which identity do you want to use? I'd suggest Vladimir Hayek. Still a Czech journalist? Yes. Still based in Paris? Yes. Has anyone else used him? <laughs> you agree? Well, I think it's... Uh... I've had an offer of service, Jim. On the military side. His cover name is Testify. You're a military-minded chap. Two of you should hit it off pretty well. He's fond of horses, too. Something else you've got in common. We can chat polo, I suppose, sir. Huh? His real name is Stefcek. At the moment, he's an artillery general, but... In the past, he's worked in close liaison with Russian intelligence. Very close. And now he wants to talk to us. I have personally interviewed an intermediary in Austria. Stefcek now wants to testify to a ranking officer of mine who can speak Czech. Why? 
There was a girlfriend, student, 20 years difference between them. Such things happen. She was shot during the uprising of 68. Sevchek never forgave the Russians for it. He's been after their blood ever since, lain low, stayed friendly. All the time he's been waiting his chance. Now he's ready. How sure are you? Steph check. Rocketry. Ballistics. Fourth man in Czech Army Intelligence. Secretary of the National Internal Security Committee. Anglo-American desk in Prague. He's big, Jim. And he's got treasure for us. He's worked for Moscow Center's England section. And he's going to give us the name of the agent Moscow planted inside our setup. We have a mole, Jim. London? Very near the top. In the circus? One of the top five. Their code name for him is Gerald. We've a rotten apple, Jim. And the maggots are eating up the circus. These people want to leave. Why not? Are the British incapable of a deception? We've turned enough members of other outfits, Russians, Poles, Czechs, even the odd American. Why shouldn't there be a mole in the circus? Now, look at them. No control, I know who they are. Listen, Jim, we've got to have code names for them. Do you remember the nursery rhyme, Tinker Tailor, Soldier Sailor? Finish it. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. Percy Alanine, Director of Operations, Tinker. Tinker. Bill Hayden, Head of Personnel. Taylor, Roy Bland, head of Iron Curtain Networks, soldier. We leave out sailor, too much like Taylor could be misheard. Rich man. Don't like it. Sounds like police work, fraud, Swiss bank stuff. Toby Esterhazy, top lamplighter, our exquisite head sleuth. Poor man, <laughs> yes. Poor man. And George Smiley, my devoted deputy, beggar man. Have you got it? I remember. All I want from you, Jim, is one, one word. Just the one code name. If you have to scrawl it on the front door of the embassy in Prague, or phone our resident Hood and shout it in his ear before you go underground. If there's some kind of a fumble, then that should be necessary. Just give me that one word. But remember, Jim, if you're caught, deny me. I don't know you there. Where do I meet Stefchek? How? When? On Friday, March 20th, Stefchek will be inspecting the weapon research station at Tishnov, near Brno, about 100 miles north of the Austrian border. From there, he'll be visiting a hunting lodge for the weekend alone. It's a place high up in the forest, not far from Rachitse. He'll provide you with an escort from Brno. And he expects you on the evening of Saturday, March 21st. Hmm. What does, uh, what does he get from us? Usual assurances, if and when he wants to come, we'll look after him. One word will do it, Jim. I'm almost there. Thank you. 
Nezdržujte to, prosím vás, najděte si ty klíče, to máte mít připravené. Tady za opodem, pane Heku. Nedoufám, že taky za zábavou. Vy z Francie nevaří deobré pivo.
No jde to, ale doktor mi řekl, že nesmím řídit díl než tři hodiny. Hoři v žety. Ne, máte sedět se mnou vepředu, je to bezpečnější. Co ty dají, jo? A taky demokratičnější. Hoře v žety. Máte pistoli? Hoře v žety. Máte zprávu pro generála? Teda jedna, jedna žena jako divá za chlapama. A když stojí za nima ve frontě, tak jim šahá ze zadu na koule. To a jednou zrovna taky začalo pršet. Nehybejte se a nemluvte. Vylezte, baraku. A malu. Dej si to na sebe. Ty chatě, budu za generálem, až se jí vrátíš, až tu budu bezpečné. Proč? Já vím, že to je bezpečné. Chci, kdybych rozvítil, mohl by tě snadno dostat. Ale ti, ti, ti.
Barabbas was a bookseller. Mr. Smiley, please. You're making an investment. I hope you'll remember that the day I sell it back to you. It's always a pleasure to do business with you, sir. You always have a joke for me. I think, after all, we could trust this to the post office. Yes, sir. I'll send it on, Mr. Smiley. I'll slip out that way, if you don't mind. Of all, sir. Maestro himself. Don't say you've forgotten me. Hello, Roddy. Nice to see you. How marvellous to run into you. They told me you were locked up with the monks in St. Gallen or somewhere, poring over manuscripts. Self-exile, they said. Of course, I knew that wasn't true, because I know you, George. <laughs> You'd never leave England. You're just not capable of such an act of abandonment, no matter how shabbily the circus treated you. So? What have you been doing all these months? I want to know everything, every little bit. How's the delectable wife? How is the lovely Lady Anne? Not in town at the moment, I hear. Pound to a penny you're shopping for her. Little presies all the time, they tell me. Going away gifts, coming home gifts. Are you back on the beat, George? Or did you never really chuck it in? Is that it, George? Has it all been covered? Cover, George? Roddy, I've retired. All right, George, if you say so. You look well, Roddy, but I mustn't delay. Oh, no, George, really, my dear old friend, you can't get away like that. Roddy Martindale simply wouldn't let you. It's months and months since we last had a gin wax. Ah, let me buy you a little aperitif, and then let me take you to dinner. Allow me that privilege. Honor me, George. I can tell by the look of you that no one else has claimed you tonight. Oh, it's kind of you, It's but my well. role in life, George. We all need to be good at something. <laughs> and we mustn't forget Jebedee. Wasn't he your old tutor? Yes, once upon a time. How do you rate Spark, the one who came from the School of Oriental Languages? Place him in the batting order, George. Not quite there. Had trouble with his nerves, so they say. What a pity. <laughs> All dead and gone now, of course. Properly appreciated by only a select few like you and me. You flatter me. Now, George, let's talk about your old boss, Control. The only head of the circus who ever kept his name a secret. Shall we talk about Control? If you insist. Of course, it wasn't a secret to you, was it, George? She never had any secrets from you, his tried and trusted right hand, did he? I don't know. That's the point about secrets. Closest thieves, Control and Smiley wear, right to the end, so they say. They are very complimentary. Now, don't flirt, George. I'm an old trooper. You and Control were just like that. That's why you were thrown out. It's why Bill Hayden's got your job. It's why Percy Allerline got into Control's chair when it ought to be you. Why, Bill Hayden's his cupbearer, and you're out altogether. 
if you say so, Roddy. I do. I say more than that. Far more. I say this. Control never died at all. He's been seen in South Africa. Now, we can't blame a man for wanting a bit of peace in the evening of his life. Willie and Arthur walked straight into him in Joburg Airport in the waiting room. Not a ghost. Flesh. That's the most idiotic story I've ever heard. Control died of a heart attack after a long illness through most of which he continued to work. Besides, he hated South Africa. He hated everywhere except Surrey, the circus, and Lord's Cricket Ground. Yes, of course. Willie Andrew Arthur was always the most god-awful liar. I said the same myself. Willie, you should be ashamed of yourself. I, um, suppose what put the last nail into Control's coffin was the Checo scandal. The poor devil that got shot in the back. The one who was so thick with Bill Hayden. With his picture in the newspapers under some fictitious name. But we know his real name, don't we? Jim Perito. Somehow, I don't think I can ever quite believe in Percy Alleline as chief, can you? Might be just my natural cynicism. But power sits poorly on those we've grown up with, doesn't it? And there are so few who can carry it off for me nowadays. And poor Percy's such an obvious fellow, especially after Control, who's a positive serpent. How can anyone take Alaline seriously? Oh, that heavy good fellowship. One has only got to think of him in the old days, lolling in the bar of the travellers, sucking away on that log of a pipe, and buying drinks for all the moguls. Oh, <laughs> really? One does like one's perfidy to be subtle, don't you agree? Now, what's his knack, George? Living off the wits of his subordinates, am I right? Really, Roddy, I can't help you. I never knew Percy as a force, you see. Only as a... Striver? Right. With his eyes on Control's purple, day and night. Yes, well, now he's actually wearing it, and the mob loves him. So who's doing the business for him, eh, George? Who is it? I cannot help you. Who's the clever boots? Well, not Percy, that's for sure. And don't tell me the Americans have started trusting us again, because they'd never fall for Percy. Roddy, please stop this. Wonderfully well he's doing. We hear it from all sides. Little committees popping up with funny names, red carpet for Percy wherever he goes, tripping the light fantastic along the Whitehall corridors. You're out of my depth, truly. So who's earning him his reputation? Uh, no, thank you. I, I think we've finished now. It's my party, George. I'll get the bill when I'm ready. So who's pulling the strings for Percy Puppet? How about dashing Bill Hayden, your old rival? In every sense, I'm told. Of course, he never was orthodox, was he? Genius never is. All right, then. It's Roy Bland, the shop-soiled white hope, the first red brick don to make the circus. And if it's neither of them, and control is really dead, then there's only one possibility left. It's someone who's pretending to be in retirement. You, George. Admit it. You featherhead, Martindale. You pompous, bogus, gossiping old featherhead. Roy Bland is not Red Brick. He was at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. Now, don't be silly, dear. Of course St. Anthony is Red Brick. It doesn't make the slightest difference there's a bit of sandstone in the same street. Just because he was your protege. I suppose he's Bill Hayden's boy now. Well, Bill was father to them all, wasn't he? Or something like that. It's not mine, thank you. I hope you're not going to tip him. It's a guinea at Christmas. Anyway, it's my party. 
draws them like bees to a honeypot, doesn't he, our Bill? Good night, Roddy. You fancy a nightcap? Start afresh with a bubbly? Why not, George? I think I will. Of course, Bill's got the glamour, hasn't he? Not like some of us. Star quality, I call it. One of the very few. I'm told the women literally bow down before him. If that's what women do. Good night. Love to Anne. Everybody's love to Anne. Everybody's love to Anne. Oh, damn. Oh. Yeah. Peter? I'd leave that coat on if I were you, George. We've got a long way to go. Well, you're not me, Peter. And before I go anywhere at all, I shall change out of my sopping shoes. And also, I think, make a pot of coffee. You sound a little testy, George, old boy. Lacon is waiting for you. Me, Peter? George, I've been sent to deliver you. I've been reviewing my situation in the last half hour of hell, and I've come to a very grave decision. After a lifetime of living by my wits and on my memory, I shall give myself up full time to the profession of forgetting. I'm going to put an end to some emotional attachments which have long outlived their purpose, namely the circus, this house, my whole past. I shall sell up and buy a cottage in the Cotswolds, I think. Steeple Aston sounds about right. Do I need overnight things? I'm not taking any. And there I shall establish myself as a mild eccentric. Discursive, withdrawn, but possessing one or two lovable habits such as muttering to myself as I bumble along innocent pavements. I shall become an oak of my own generation. You make the coffee. You know where everything is. You can even pick my front door locks. 
clever, beautiful woman. I saw you parking this toy in Kirsten Street this afternoon. I ran away immediately. Good guess on your part. What made you think I was looking for you? I hoped you weren't. However, you found me eventually. You had to come home sometime. It's far too young for you, Peter. It's quick. I'm surprised you didn't get thrown out with the rest of us. You had all the qualifications for dismissal. Good at your work, loyal, discreet. What happened tonight, George? How's Anne? Roddy Martindale happened tonight. Why do I permit it? I tell myself it's for politeness sake. It's not. It's weakness. And the fact that I've nothing better to do. My wife's fine. They put me in charge of scalp hunters. You are Jim Frieda's successor. You, looking after the heavy mob. Why not? Tucked away at downtown Brixton, behind the broken glass and the barbed wire, dispatching the thugs occasionally. Kept a good arm's length from the circus ringmasters. How is Jim, do you know? In quarantine. I don't mean to pry, I merely ask. Can he get around? Can he walk and so on? Bad backs can be terribly tricky, I believe. The word is he manages pretty well. He's back in England. Address unknown. Trap. Is that still the scalp hunter's official name? Hit and run, caution carry. Sorry. Our control always preached that good intelligence work is gradual and rests on a kind of gentleness. It's not my department. No. Well, the scalp hunters were always the exception control allowed to his own rule. On Bill Hayden's persuasion. A reflection of Bill's temperament, of course. The solo initiative. Very dashing. Very audacious. Sorry, Peter, what? Lateralism. I said, are you familiar with the word? I most certainly am not. It's the in doctrine now. We used to go up and down. Now we go along. What's that supposed to mean? In your day, the circus ran itself by regions. Africa, satellites, Russia, China, Southeast Asia, West Indies, you name it. Each region was commanded by its own juju man. Control sat in heaven and held the strings, remember? It strikes a distant chord. Well, today, everything operational is under one hat. It's called London Station. Regions are out, lateralism is in. Who's station commander? Bill Hayden. His number two is Roy Bland. Toby Esterhazy runs between them like a poodle. They're a service within the service. Share their own secrets and don't mix with the proles. There are three of them and Alalai. That's right. The object of Dahl is to make us more secure. A very good idea.
Why did Lacon send you for me, Peter? Do you mean why did he send me for you, or why did he send me for you? Quite right, Peter. I should have known better than to ask. You remember your last day at the circus? Just one day before control departed and the new regime took over. You stuck your head around my office door and said, Peter, I've been sacked. We went straight out and you got drunk. Why pick me, George? I was pretty low grade, running some very sketchy networks of merchant seamen out of London Dockland. Whatever, Poles, Russians, chinks I could cobble together. Why me, George? You want a reason? You fastened on the same word that night when I asked why you'd been kicked out. I'll tell you exactly what you said. And I hope this isn't going to be embarrassing. You said reason as logic or reason as motive, or reason as a way of life. You said they don't have to give me reasons. I can write my own damn reasons, and that is not the same as the half-baked tolerance that comes from no longer caring. I thought that was pretty impressive stuff from a man as drunk as you were. At least I had the good sense not to let you drive me home. Lakin sent me for you, George. Looks like Count Dracula's blood bank. Lakin once described it to me as his Hampshire Camelot, built by a teetotal millionaire, which he seems to think explains everything. That's so out of touch, Peter. Does Lacon have any particular title nowadays? Nothing new. Just Sir Oliver of the Cabinet's office. Permanent watchdog of all intelligence affairs. You know how he loves being one of nature's prefects. George, hello. Thanks for coming. Come on in, will you? Willem? Hope we didn't get too advanced about it. You've been enjoying retirement, George? You haven't missed the wars of human contact. I rather would, I think. One's work, one's old buddies. Oh, I think I manage very well, thank you. Yes, yes, I'm sure I do. And you, all goes well with you? Oh, no great changes, no, no, all very smooth. Charlotte got her scholarship to Rodin, it was nice. Oh, very good. Hmm. And how about your wife? In the pink and so on? Very bonny, thank you. Ah, all spruce and shipshape again, Willem? You were grubby. He did look a ruffian, didn't he, George? Well, um, shall we? Oh, please, George, I want him to talk particularly to you. All right, Paul, lock us in, please. I think you know Mr. Smiley, don't you? Yes, of course I do. Once gave me a job, Mr. Smiley. Don't you remember? Tar, sir. Ricky Tar, the lawyer's boy from Marseille. Changed my first nappies, as we used to say. They were very tough interviews he used to give us tender young recruits. Of course, 12 years ago, and... Uh, it's that long, Mr. Smiley. Well, you don't look any different to me, sir. No, 12 years ago, nobody but nobody got taken on unless we got past you. Not even scalp hunters. I weren't quite your type. We all had to get the nod from Mr. Smiley. Ta. Of course I remember you, Ricky. Your father was an Australian, I recall. A solicitor and a non-conformist lay preacher. Altogether a most unusual chap to pop up in Marseille. But just such odd circumstances do seem to provide us with suitable personnel. Hmm. Bad boys like Ricky. Daddy thought he could beat the sin out of me, but you knew better, didn't you, Mr. Smiley? He only beat it further in. And that's what scalp hunters are made of. 
Isn't that right, Mr. Gwillen? We're waiting for you, Tar. Yes, I do think we ought to get on. Well, I guess I'd better make my pitch, then. Let's keep it precise, shall we? All the way along. Before you begin, Ricky, do I understand correctly that no one at the circus knows you're in England? Only Mr. Gwillem. You're officially absent without leave. On the wanted list. I think I'm safe now. I've got a story to tell you. It's all about spies. And if it's true, which I think it is, you boys are going to need a whole new organization. Right? Shall I start with the day you sent me to Lisbon? Changed my life. You might find it's going to change all your lives. Our resident buffoon, old galloping major called Tufty Thessinger, wanted a helping hand. My boss says you've got your eyes on a likely piece of merchandise for us. Well, what's his style then, Mr. Boris? He's a real flash, Harry. Exactly. Not your common garden Russian granite face at all. During the day, he fulfills his norm like the rest of his mob. There's a whole mixed bag of technical advisors here. Bodies is with silver engineers. But come nightfall, he makes his own arrangements. That's just a farce that clubs as if there's never going to be another tomorrow. The man hasn't slept for a week, and my boys are folding at the knees. <laughs> a young Muscovite with official connections and that kind of appetite for the flesh pots seems ripe for the picking. Use another defector, can't we? Absolutely. Got to keep in stock. Nothing else on him apart from the booze. Well, I've got something to blackmail him on. I would hardly need London to come and fix it. Would I? Temper, temper, tough. Some people, when I say from Moscow, I see this look in their faces. It's so funny. I know what they're thinking. Rush, oh my God, he's going to doctrinate us. Put our names in his little black book. And then the awful men with the black hats and the black overcoats will come tap tap at the door and get on my And they'll say, Boris is your good friend of Russia. You want to tell us all about his secret sex life with the member of parliament and the mayor. Let me get you all another thing. Yes, 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 please be my guest. Waiter!
And I am telling you, we're definitely in the wrong ball game with this, chummy. That's a professional, a Mosca Center trained hood. The way he sets himself. That alone. Well, if you're right. Okay, you know. He'd be quite a catch, wouldn't he? We scalp hunters are expressly forbidden to trawl for double agents, new orders from above. At the first smell of the opposition, abandon and drop hot potato into ample lap of London station. No, nope. I'm cabling Willem no sale and booking myself a flight home. Okie dokie, Ricky. And since the job is finished, let us seed it, so to speak. Nags me a bit, though, this Boris. Makes his rounds every night, does he? Never missed yet. I told you, my boys. Well, before I go, I might just take a peep inside Boris's kennel. See what's under the mattress. Can't be any harm in that, can there? Orders is orders. I like keeping my hand in. It's been quiet lately. You can get rusty. Well, enjoy yourself, my son. But don't break any eggs, Ricky, please. I have to live here, remember? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain. Boris? Good question, lady. Where is Boris? This is his room, right? And believe me, lady, I wish you no harm. I'm sorry if I frightened you. You caught me by surprise, I can tell you. I wasn't expecting a lady, just Boris. I'm his wife. What are you doing no, here? Look, I don't want to upset you. Does my husband know you? No point in pussyfooting, lady. Well, it's this way. Your Boris walked off with my girl tonight, and that's one diabolical liberty. And to add insult to injury, he'd been drinking on my wife. So I thought I'd come up here and have a word with Boris. Sorry, but that's the way it is. Thanks for not screaming the place down. You should be careful what you say about my husband. He's an important man. He has influential friends. You frighten me off, Mrs. Boris. I've got quite a name for looking after myself. I'm your original Australian self-made success story. Rags to riches and punching all the way. 
Bureaucrats don't scare me, not even the bloody Russian kind. Don't call me Mrs. Baris. My name's Irina. I'm Tony Lawrence. Are you? Yeah, Tony Lawrence. You just mentioned that name in Adelaide. I mean, car sales, property, frozen foods. You know, if I was Boris, I wouldn't be out at night chasing other blokes' women. I wouldn't feel the need. Boris is Boris. And Lawrence... ...someone else. I don't know anything about Australia. Perhaps somewhere tomorrow. Evening. Are you sure you don't want something stronger? You look as if it might help. Oh, don't misunderstand me, Irina. You look great. Really lovely. I just meant it might relax you. <laughs> you know, you seem more scared now than you were last night. No, it can't be me. I'm not supposed to do this. Meet people. Talk without official approval. I'm not free to do that. Where's the harm? Just two strangers in a foreign land getting to like each other. It's normal behaviour. I do special work. I travel as a trade delegate in my own right. Textiles. I'm highly trained, experienced. I hate it. I want to escape from it. Textile. It's like a prison. I need someone to help me. You can be quite brave, Lawrence. Tony. I shall call you Lawrence. Colonel Lawrence. Like Lawrence of Arabia? He was English. I know. There's an English expression. It takes one to spot one. You wouldn't have fooled me for long. Even without putting those wedges in the door. It's the way we look for things, isn't it? We don't stare. We don't seem to be looking. We are not like tourists. Or prostitutes. Or pickpockets. We just know how to see. Paris isn't as good as he ought to be. He enjoys showing off too much, so he misses things. He missed you, didn't he? But you didn't miss him, did you, Colonel? Are you very good? The best. God gave me all the talents. Try me. I like being in the presence of Christianity. 
I understand why some women become nuns. Give themselves their whole lives given. Believe me. There's freedom in that. I've met Christians I've envied very deeply. Envy is a sin, I know that. But I confess it here in this holy place. There, Christians were being interrogated. The worst time to see people. And the best sometimes. I'm studying the Bible, secretly, of course. That isn't freedom. Come on to me, all you who are heavy laden. Is that it? Do you know how it goes on? There's a village below here, right by the sea, very quiet. We could take a room. Would you like that? a team a long time ago. He's a specialist in picking up foreign businessmen from Moscow Center. I look after communications for him, for special calls. Couldn't we be a team? You could take me to England. That's what I want, Lawrence. You could. I know something. Something so important. It's one of the biggest secrets ever. It will make you so famous. But it's so secret. Tell me. Tell me, Irene. I'm frightened. I can look after you. You'll be safe. I can only speak to your chief. I mean, Alain, nobody else. It's too dangerous. I can only speak to Alain. Tell me. Only the head of the circus. looking for me. There's too much to tell now. Maybe tomorrow. Okay. Cemetery. Come on, Lawrence. We can talk in the car. Tomorrow. There's too much. Be calm. Tonight they'll notice. I drink too much sometimes. 
they are used to that. Some of the priests are drunkards. They told me that at school. When I was still in Moscow, before I started traveling with Paris, I had a relationship with a filing clerk at the center in Dzerzhinsky Square. We went against regulations we used to meet outside. He was very sweet. Your looks remind me of him. His name was Ivlov, and he told me a story. He was frightened, too. But sometimes, if you know something that's so big, so secret, you have to tell it to someone. It has to be someone you love. Like I'm telling you now. It's all right, darling. It's all right. Have you heard of Carla? He's an old fox, the most cunning of them all at the center. And he works so secretly that some people don't even know he exists. This story Vlov told me concerns one of Carla's greatest conspiracies. And it is happening in England. Do you know what is meant by the word mole? Yes. Moles burrow very deep into the fabric of Western imperialism. They are very dear to Moscow Center because it may take 15 or even 20 years before they are used. Well, my friend Ivlov told me he had worked in London. His cover was as a driver at the embassy. Do you have a name to give me? Ivlov's work name in London was Lapin. He didn't know it meant rabbit in French. It fitted because at the embassy he was supposed to be just a nobody, serving drinks with women at receptions. But all the time, he was the secret right-hand man to Colonel Gregor Viktorov. And Viktorov is the agent who briefs and debriefs them all. His name, Irina. In London, Viktorov's cover is cultural attaché, known as Balyakov. I'm so frightened, so tired. You must take me home with you. We could be happy. Finish the story. Who's the mole? Where is he? I can only speak to Alela. We are in danger. You must get me to him. Face to face with the head of the circus. Nothing else is safe. You trust me, don't you? I want you. Alaline will take some persuading. Tell him I have information crucial to the well-being of the circus. Use those words. Morning, Tufty. 
Can I come and play with your toys? I thought you'd finish your holes, Ricky. What must they be thinking back home? They'll be all right. Got a postcard to send them. They're going to love me for it. message is graded flash to London station and by hand of duty officer only. Mm -hmm. Drastic stuff, eh? That's maximum security limit. What did you get on, Boris? Right. It's your show, my son. for you, Ricky. Again. Applied date of intake into Moscow Center. Name her present head of section. Also name previous sections employing her. Also, someone stalling. But if that's what they want. Lawrence, listen, I'm talking to you. This is my gift for you in case they take me away before I can speak to Aleline. I would prefer to give you my life, Lawrence, but I think it more likely that this wretched secret will be all I have to make you happy. Use it well. I started to tell you about Ivlov, who's known in London, or used to be, as Lapin, and about Viktorov, who's really Palyakov. The mole in London is known by the code name of Gerald. There are many remarkable measures to preserve his security, the most secret imaginable. Written reports from Gerald to Carla in Moscow Center are cut in two and sent by separate couriers even after coding. And Gerald's output has sometimes been almost too much for Polyakov to handle. Some of it is spoken onto tape at secret meetings and can only be played back on special machines. And there is also undeveloped film. And anyone opening the reels the wrong way destroys it immediately. Lawrence, this is the secret I'm giving you with all my love. The mole Gerald 
is a high functionary in British intelligence, very close to the head of the circus. Lawrence, I fear for the safety of anyone employed by the circus. Take care with this knowledge. I'm telling you this because I'm afraid it's all finished for me. The guards have started watching me like animals. Have you been indiscreet, Lawrence? Did you tell them in London more than you let me think? Now you understand why only Aleline would do. But do not blame yourself. Will they let us live in Scotland, Lawrence? I've read everything about Scotland. It's the Garden of Eden, isn't it? Well, there's a bit at the end. Read it. In my heart, I am free. Deep inside me burns a new and blessed light. I used to think that the secret world was a separate place and I was banished forever to an island of half people. But God has shown me we have only to open the door and step outside to be free. Lawrence, you must always long for the light which I have found. It is called love. Now I shall take this to our secret place while there is still time. And that's it. I take it that's not the original notebook? No, sir. Where is it? Well, I put it straight back in the dead letter box once I'd copied. And then? I had this idea I'd try the airport. You know, just on the off chance. Well, put it this way, sir. I had to know. I got hold of a little Italian air hostess, and uh, she liked the look of me, see. She told me an unscheduled Soviet plane had taken off two or three hours before. The centre of attraction was a woman invalid, lady in a coma. They had to cart her to the plane on a stretcher and her face was wrapped in bandages. The rest of the party was made up of two male nurses and a doctor. Now, I didn't let it go at that, Mr Smiley. No, I checked the hotel. No arena, no Boris. My musical daughters. Perhaps she really was ill. Not much more than 24 hours between your first telegram and Irina's departure. You can hardly lay it at London's door on that timing. Well, you can, just. If someone in London had very good footwork. And in Moscow, too, of course. That's what I told myself, sir. I mean what you said. My very words, Mr. Smart. Well, I figured the Russians could have tumbled to it about her having it off with me, or else she'd started blabbing to Boris just to pay him off for boozing and whoring all the time. But then I thought, no, come on, Ricky. That was gold she was giving you. Remember how she had to sweat it out of herself? I figured they'd give her another going over on the plane and the big boys would pile in first thing after touchdown. I figured not more than a day or two before Moscow Centre had a footpad round of the cemetery. So you made yourself scarce. He panicked and went native. Istanbul, so he says. Playing the loving father with a daughter called Danny. That's right, Danny's my little kid. The mother seems to be leader of the pack as far as his numerous wives are concerned just now. You've been away for three months. Why choose this particular moment to come to us? Go on. Did something frighten you? Someone looking for me. Who? I didn't stop to find out. That's why I came. No, Ricky. Passports. Who are you at the moment? Poole, British. Well, I reckon Lawrence wasn't exactly the flavor of the month in Moscow, so I had that run up. 
not bad for the money. When he went to Lisbon, he had two Swiss escapes. One for him, one for Boris. What did you do with them? How did you get rid of them? Burn them. And how did you get back to England? Soft route via Dublin. I've given Mr. Quillam the details. I'm doing what I can to check. Well, you be damn careful, baby, because I don't want the wrong people on my back. Took my gun away, too. Now, he shouldn't have done that, should he, Mr. Smiley? Why did you go to Mr. Quillam? Didn't it cross your mind he might turn you straight over to Aladine? Mr. Quillam's my boy. Besides, I don't figure he's got any more liking for the new arrangements at the circus than you have, Mr. Smiley. We don't need that tar. He kept well out of sight. As soon as he gave me a story, I rang Sir Oliver from a call box. I rang him here, not London. Well, uh, damn it, there was no reason to suppose the phone was tapped. There was every reason. It's very unusual for Moscow Center to use a husband and wife team. Hard to believe. Unless, of course, they had children in Moscow. Hostages. They have. It's true. Common law marriage. Unofficial, but permanent. There's a lot the other way around these days, believe it or not, Mr. Smiley. Fit George. Natter. Garden. Super. Paul. When you came to me six months ago talking about a mole in the circus, I'm afraid I threw you out. I was remiss. You instructed me to abandon my inquiries because they were unconstitutional. Oh, was that the word I used? How very pompous of me. You never had any, did you? What? Children. No. I have to admit, I didn't absolutely trust your motives. I rather thought control had put you up to it, you see, as a way of hanging on to the power, keeping Percy Alaline out. There are three of them, and Alaline. Control's words. The composition of the now all-powerful London station. Bill Hayden. Roy Bland, Toby Esterhazy, three of them, and Alamai. Yes, quite, but at the time, George. After all, we both held perfectly honorable positions. You felt Jim Prido had been betrayed in that shoot-up in Czechoslovakia and you wanted a witch hunt. My minister and I felt there'd been gross incompetence on the part of control. We wanted a new broom, a view which the foreign office shared, to put it mildly. Oh, I quite understand your dilemma. Thank you. It isn't every day the head of one's secret service embarks on a private war against the Czechs. And don't forget, George, you were Control's man. He preferred you to Hayden. When he lost his grip and launched that extraordinary misadventure, it was you who fronted for him. You were in the hot seat. You had to go. It wasn't as if you offered a suspect. Remember the circumstances, George. All in all, I'd say Percy Allerlein has done extremely well. With Bill Hayden to field for him, who wouldn't? He's produced intelligence instead of scandal and won the trust of his customers. That special source of Percy's, it produced the witchcraft material. Is that still running? Since you ask, yes. Source Merlin is our mainstay. And, yes, the name of his product is Witchcraft. The circus hasn't produced such good material in living memory. But mine, anyway. Does it still get the same special handling? Certainly. And now precautions will have to be more rigorous than ever, won't they? 
No, Gerald the Mole would soon latch on to that. Of course he would. We can't move, can we? We can't investigate because we can't employ the circus. We can't eavesdrop or what or open mail because to do any of that, we need the services of Esther Hayes' lamplighters. And Esther Hazy is suspect like the others. It's the oldest question of all, George. Who can spy on the spies? Get the security mob in. They'll do a job for you. They know the minister won't have that. Rightly, too. A lot of ex-colonial bobbies flying through the circus files. It's a serious point, George. We do have agents in the field, and I wouldn't give much for their chances once the security gentlemen come barging in. How many do we have? 600. Give or take a few. Plus 120 behind the iron curtain. So I can't tell the minister you'll do it, can I? He'll take the job, clean the stables, go backwards, go forwards, do whatever's necessary. It's your generation, after all. Your legacy. I never heard of anyone yet who'd left the circus without some unfinished business. There's no emotional or other reason which you feel might debar you from the assignment. You must speak up, George. The state of my marriage must be very common knowledge if it's got as far down the line as Ricky Tarr. For the record, the thing with Anne and Bill Hayden is long over. My wife's present infatuation is with a young actor, currently unemployed. There's always that part of us that belongs to the public domain, isn't it? You always knew that, I'm sure. So did Jim Prido. What does that mean? Well, good Lord, George, a bullet in the back is held to be quite a sacrifice, isn't it? Even in your world. Two bullets, actually. They were at Oxford together, weren't they? Bill and Jim. And stablemates at the circus, the famous Hayden Prido partnership. The Iron Fist in the Iron Glove, somebody once called it. Frido was far too old for that Czechoslovakian nonsense. It made no difference. Oh, why? I shall need some help. Remember Controls Man, Mendel? Yes, of course. If he's the chap you want. <laughs> Georgian, so you will love it for me, won't you, Mr. Barraclough? I shouldn't lend it to you, really. It was the Major's. I'm very grateful, I'm sure. Everything all right, Mr. Barraclough? Yes, fine. Thank we'll you. leave you in peace, then. Every scrap. And you've known me long enough. Times of entry and exit, who comes, who goes, and most of all, more important than you can possibly imagine, this. Any suspicious characters taking an interest or putting questions to your staff under any pretext, even if they say they're the guards armoured and Sherlock Holmes rolled into one. There's only me and Norman, Inspector. And they won't get far with Norman, will they, dear? You're too sensitive. Now, Ricky Tarr's cables for the circus were detailed and specific. He was required by London Station to submit copious background on Irina. Names of former contacts, acquaintances inside Moscow Centre. There should be a file of some size, and we need to see it. 
That circus material, George, I can deliver only from the minister. I know that look, George. I'm breaking into the circus, am I? Playing burglar bill. If you wouldn't mind, Peter. And while you're enjoying yourself, I shall visit Oxford to look up an old and invaluable friend. Please, don't take any unnecessary risks. You must assume, Peter, the circus has the dogs on you 24 hours a day. Think of it as a foreign country. Hello, Bryant. Hello, nice to see you again, sir. Mr. Long. Mr. Gwillem, sir. Yes. Mr. Lord Strickland's expecting you. He'll meet you by the barrier on the fifth floor. All right. Thanks. Well, Matt Peter, greetings. A trifle late, but never mind. Sorry, Lord. You have to make allowances when it comes to yokels. <laughs> Good God, how long have you had that monster? You really are a stranger, aren't you? It saves man eyes. Fantastic. Quite fantastic. So, oh. hello, Sorry. Bill. What the hell are you doing here, you pariah? He's got some French diplomatic courier he wants to buy, and he needs to wash some dirty money. That's a job for banking section, of course, so we're sorting out the tangle for him. He knows it has to be London Station cleared. He told me the papers were already routed to you. They're probably in your in-tray now, Bill. They had better be, Peter. Mind you, lock up the spoons. These scalp hunters will have the gold out of your teeth. Lock up the girls as well, if they'll let you. Keys of the city. London Station couldn't be in better hands. Everything's a lot tighter here these days, Willem. Hey, Lord, uh, hold on. Have you seen bloody Bill anywhere? Indeed, I have seen Bill. We were having a brief word about a couple of things back down the corridor. He's wanted urgently. Immediately, Lord, actually. We put out an alert for him. I suspect he may well be on his way to you at this moment. Peter. Hello. Hi. Thanks for the glad hand. I did wipe the cow dung off my boots. What's the joke, Roy? A joke, Peter, old lad, just surprised to see you, that's all. We're used to having this floor to ourselves. Would you like to see my past, Toby? <laughs> How are you keeping? Oh, I wintered very well, thanks. You know what it's like living in the Brixton Rest House these days. Plenty of Ludo, ping pong. Normally, I'd be having my afternoon zizz at this time. Off of you, Peter. Don't waste Lauder's time. Uh, no, sir. Sorry, sir. All right, Lord Royal, just have to wait for the wheels to turn. I don't need a pass to use the gents, do I?
flush. Stop it! Stop it, boy. Turn your dunderhead. Flush, shut up. George, smiley. Oh, you lovely darling man. You haven't come to sell me a... Uh, Hoover, you're my gorgeous George. Connie. Oh, George. Oh. Jingle, darling, could you possibly make it tomorrow? Oh, don't be cross, Jingle. It isn't often my oldest, oldest lover comes to see me. Oh, George, if only I'd seen you first. I'll give you a whole hour. All to yourself. Honestly, I will, darling. <laughs> One of my dunderheads. I will teach. Don't know why. Oh, George. Of all the lovely darling men I ever knew. What flush. Did you see his shoes? Bless you, darling. God bless. Mm. Did he walk alone, Flush? Not accompanied, were we? Quite alone, Connie. So, what does George want from Connie? A bad boy. Her memory. To go over some very old ground, Connie. Hear that flush? First they chuck us out with an old bone, then they come begging to us. I was the best head of research the circus ever had. Everyone knew that. And what did they say the day they gave me the chop? That personnel cow. You're losing your sense of proportion, Connie. It's time you got out into the real world. Well, I hate the real world. I like the circus of my, my lovely boys. Polyakov. Alexei Alexandrovich Polyakov, cultural attaché, Soviet Embassy, London. Born March the 3rd, 1922, in the Ukraine. Graduate of Leningrad State University, height five foot ten, colour of eyes green, colour of hair black, married but unaccompanied by wife, and a six-cylinder Carla trained hood if ever I saw one. But don't tell Percy Allerline or Toby Esterhazy. Oh no. Alexei Alexandrovich was as pure as the driven snow. He was Purcell White, wasn't he, Flush? And Connie's an old silly, because if she doesn't lay off and do as she's told, she'd have to pack her bags and go. He's come alive. Polyakov, just as you predicted. Of course he has. Of course he has. I knew it in my bones. The day he arrived, I thought, hello, I'm going to have some fun with you. Tough as a button. Cultural attaché balls. Army written all over him. But not declared, George. Not a mention. Oh, he had a lovely voice. Mellow like yours. I used to play the tapes over and over just to, to bathe in it. Bottom picture, too. <laughs> I just know. Not that we ever caught him at it. We might have done if... Tobe had played along and offered him a bum or two, but Tiny Tobe wouldn't. Eight years. I watched Pretty Polly for eight years. Then last Remembrance Day, I got him. There he was, that smashing November morning at the wreath laying, and we photographed his medals, two gallantry and four campaign. Oh, yes. Alex Polyakov was a star soldier. 
just I'd told them. I'm not a word. So I said to Toby, listen, you two-faced ferret. Ego has got the better part of cover, and that's nothing new. Now will you turn pretty Polly inside out for me, because Connie's little hunch has turned up trumps. And what did Toby Esther Hazy say? Oh, I got the dead fish voice. Tell Percy Alleline Percy's in charge. And then? Not every ex-warrior's a Carla agent, says Percy. I said, listen, Percy, Polyakov's running an English mole. So I get the rude letter. Stop it or else. So I wrote at the bottom, yes, repeat, no. So, here we are. Flush and me. Please kiss me, George. Hey ho, halcyon days. Did I start the landslide, George? You were always dead right, Connie. And is George now picking up the pieces? Something of the sort. Poor loves. Trained to empire. Trained to rule the waves. Englishmen could be proud then. They could, George. Oh, God. Taken away. Bye bye, world. If it's bad, George, don't come back. Promise? I want to remember you just as you were. My lovely, lovely boys. Promise. Pages have been removed with a razor blade. No mention whatever of Ricky Tarr's cables from Lisbon. No Irina, no Boris, no Tarr. There's a note scribbled on the next page which says all inquiries to head of London station. It's in Toby Esterhazy's handwriting. The janitor's attendance list has also been removed. Nothing to tell us who was duty officer that night. Or even who was in the building. Connie's appraisal matches the story Irina gave Ricky Tarr. The implications, the indications, are that Carla has managed to build himself a card of senior men placed about the globe who work directly and exclusively to him at Moscow Center. Polyakov is Carla's executant in London. You offer that? The working hypothesis. Operation Witchcraft, that vital flow of Russian intelligence which happily came Alaline's way. Supplementary estimates to the Treasury. Special accommodation in London. Wider exploitation. See also Secret Annex. May I see it? The Minister keeps it in his personal safe. Do you know the combination? Certainly not. What's the title of this unobtainable document? It doesn't have one. It's highly secret and we've done everything humanly possible to keep the readership to a minimum. The supplier of the witchcraft material is our old friend Merlin. Does the file give his identity? Oh, don't be ridiculous. The minister wouldn't want to know. And Alaline wouldn't want to tell him. What does wider exploitation mean? I refuse to be interrogated, George. I entirely fail to see why I should waste your time pursuing this line of inquiry. By rights, I should have you specially cleared before I let you see any of this. Witchcraft cleared? Yes, George. Do we have a list of people who've been cleared in that way? I hope you're not going fey, George. 
please stick with the primary problem, the mole, Gerald, instead of rootling around in extraneous matters. This is no time to be whimsical. Oh, are you off? You won't forget Predo, will you? Anything at all you can get on him, even the scraps would help. He has a point, George. Witchcraft and Merlin. Polyakov and the Mole. Predo getting himself shot up on some wild goose chase of controls in the rural charms of Czechoslovakia. You think it all connects? I think, Peter, I'm not the first to make this journey of exploration. I believe control was here before me. He might even have made the full distance. But for the bullets in Predo's back, there are three of them and Alaline. Control's words. He meant Operation Witchcraft, of course. Merlin's minders or inventors or programmers or marionettes or what? Why was Control always so hostile to Alaline? Percy wasn't a complete fool. Percy can flirt, Peter. And Control hadn't reckoned on the power of the Alaline lobby. Who were they? Golfers. Golfers and conservatives. That's what Control said to me. I got a call from Control one day, very sharp, very combative. George, come in here or there'll be bloodshed. <clears throat> Brother Percy's trying to twist my tail. Take a look at this nonsense. Top-level Soviet naval dispatch. Specially prepared for the Soviet high command. Isn't it, Percy? An appreciation of a naval exercise in the Midland of Black Sea, of which our sailors have been screaming for details. Haven't they, Percy? Topicality is always suspect. Yes, George. Would you like to repeat that for Percy? Who made the translation? God made it, didn't he, Percy? Don't ask him anything he won't tell you. Short to sea strike power, radio activation of enemy alert procedures. This is hardly my territory. Don't let that worry you. Total ignorance of subject matter doesn't bother Percy. <laughs> Whose initials are these? Zarov, Admiral, Black Sea Fleet. What do our own evaluators say? They've not seen it, and what's more, they're not going to. However, my brother in Christ Lily of Naval Intelligence has passed a preliminary opinion, has he not, Percy? Percy showed it to him last night. Over a pink gin, was it, Percy? Cut the admiral, Tim. Note that, George. They battened down the hatches and bunged up the portholes for Percy. Brother Lily telephoned me half an hour ago congratulate me. He believes this material to be neither a plant nor chicken feed, but genuine gold dust. And he seeks our permission to... Percy's, I suppose I should say, to apprise his fellow sea lords of its conclusions. Quite impossible. It's for his eyes only, at least for another couple of weeks. It's so hot, you see, George. But where does it come from? Who's the case officer? You'll enjoy this. Source Merlin has access to the most sensitive levels of Soviet policy making. We've dubbed his product witchcraft. And ask him who we are, George. Merlin is the fruit of a long cultivation by certain people in his service. People who are bound to me as I am to them. People who are not at all entertained by the failure rate about this place. Been too much blown, too much lost, wasted, too many scandals. I've said so many times, I might as well have talked to the wind for all the heed he'd paid me. He means me, George. And the ordinary principles of tradecraft and security have gone to the wall in this service. It's all divide and rule, stimulated from the top. Me again. We're losing our livelihood, our self-respect. We've had enough. We've had a bellyful, in fact. 
Please. Thank you. And like everybody who's ever had enough, he wants more. Percy Allerline would sell his mother for a knighthood and this service for a seat in the House of Lords. Suppose Merlin's genuine. Suppose Merlin would pick Percy. It seems somebody has. I gather Percy's under the impression he picked himself and a whole team. You're sure he left you out, are you, George? What are you going to do about it? Depends on it. I'll wait for it to show itself. In the meantime, I see nothing to deal with, except Percy's envious eye on my chair. And I've put my thumb in that optic before. Tuesday again? No, Thursday. Kirby? Go ahead. This time. Oh, Lord. I thought it would be half over by now. You've got a rabbit to pull out of your hat today, Percy. You've got that Britain can make it look about you. Very intimidating. Should we have brought our sandwiches? I'll be brief, Bill, so long as I'm not obstructed. I'm sorry. Traffic. <clears throat> sort of walks. I think you and Percy between you are contriving to keep me off the streets. They're all here now, sir. Would you go in, please, gentlemen? How often do I have to emphasize the extreme sensitivity of the source of the witchcraft product? I must insist there is no existing method of Whitehall distribution to meet the case. Do I have to remind you of that disgraceful incident when an undersecretary, albeit overworked, so be it. But the fact remains, the man actually gave his dispatch box key to his personal assistant. We simply cannot afford that kind of ludicrous insecurity when we are handling witchcraft. Now... I have already discussed the problem with Lily of Naval Intelligence, and he is prepared to put at our disposal a special main reading room in the Admiralty Main Building where witchcraft material can be seen by our customers and watched over by a senior janitor of this service. Wouldn't you rather have Securico? The reading room will be known for cover purposes as the conference room of the Adriatic Working Party, the AWP room for short. <coughs> Thank you. Customers with reading rights will not have passes, since these can be too accessible, like keys. Instead, they will appear on a special list with their photographs, and they will identify themselves personally to my janitor. Whose janitor, Percy? Well, he's already got his own personal wizard. The odd commissioner seems modest enough domestic star. <coughs> Allowing that all this is necessary. Essential. My minister will want to know a lot more about the cost. He'll want it to appear to be borne by the Admiralty, even if you have to reimburse covertly. Yes, of course. The reading room will have to be extensively rebuilt. 
to begin with. Now, I would like to call your attention to the Foreign Office comment on the most recent witchcraft product, and I quote, this document sheds an extraordinary sidelight on Soviet aggressive thinking. Does that mean they like it, Percy? Do you like it, Bill? It's from the very heart of your territory. Buying their way in with counterfeit money. Tell them that. Tell them anything. I need time. There are three of them and Alala. Sweat them, George. Tempt them. Bully them. Any damn thing. Give them whatever they eat. I need time. as ever, Mr. Smiley. How are your children, Toby? Doing terribly well, thank you, George. The boy is at Westminster, have I got that right? Your daughter's probably left school by now, has she? First year medical student. Loves it. Good for her. Toby, I have to ask you this. Sorry to come prying. Your department's a long way behind with its worksheets. Two months, almost. Now, why is that? It's not Lamplighter's style. No, we're not infallible, George. Two months? Well, I won't question it. Is it terribly important? Of course, if you say it is, then I'll see it's dealt with, of course. The question is, why, Toby? Let me be blunt. Not your style, George. I'm allowed to say that, surely. I am, after all, one of your oldest protégés. Vienna was a long time ago. You haven't perhaps been using your staff for any special jobs lately, have you? Either at home or abroad. I mean the kind of special jobs which, for good reasons of security, you haven't felt able to mention in your returns. Who would I do that for, George? You know, in my book, that's completely illegal. Well, if Percy Alleline, for example, ordered you to do something and not recorded, that would put you in a difficult position. What sort of something? Clear a foreign letterbox, prime a safe house, watch someone's back, spike an embassy. It's all lamplighter work. If Percy told you to do it, you might quite reasonably assume he was acting on instructions from the fifth floor. I do like the service, George. I may be sentimental about it, but I prefer to stay in it. Now, you understand that, you of all people. My problem is promotion. I mean, the absence of it. I have so many years seniority that I feel actually quite embarrassed when these young fellows ask me to take orders from them. Who, Toby? Which young fellows? Roy Bland? Percy, would you call Percy young? Who? When you're overdue for promotion and working your fingers to the bone, anyone looks young who's above you on the ladder. Have you been taking orders? You know the line of command, George.
Perhaps control could move you up a few rungs. Well, you know, actually, I'm not sure he's able to these days. Are you? So what's the deal? There isn't a deal, Roy, really. It's just that Control feels the present situation is unhealthy. He doesn't like to see you getting mixed up with a cabal. Frankly, nor do I. So what's the deal? What do you want? What about 5,000 quid out the reptile fund, for starters? And then a house and a car. And a kid to eat it. Your father would turn in his grave. Let him rotate, you old commie thug. If there's no deal, George, you'll have to tell Control he can get stuffed. I've paid, you see, you know that. I don't know what the hell I've bought with it, but I've paid a packet. Poznan, Budapest, Prague, back to Poznan. Have you ever been to Poznan? Sofia, Kiev, two bloody nervous breakdowns and still between the shafts. That's big money at any age, even yours. Oh, no one can deny that, Roy. And you brought me in, remember? If you think I'm going to the bad, you've only got yourself to blame. You're an educated sort of a swine. An artist is a bloke who can hold two fundamentally opposing views and still function. Who dreamed that one up? Scott Fitzgerald. Well, Fitzgerald knew a thing or two. And I'm definitely functioning. As a good socialist, I'm going where the money is. As a good capitalist, I'm sticking with the revolution because if you can't beat it, spy on it. Don't look like that, George. It's the name of the game these days. You scratch my conscience, I'll drive your jag, right? No. Did you get that from Hayden? Is that one of Bill's jokes about materialist England, the pigs in clover society? And you like it? Not much. Of course there are competitive and acquisitive instincts in Western society, but they are offset against other concerns which you won't find in... Poznan, Budapest, Kiev, Sofia. Tell me all about it, George. I'm just saying that's England now, man. All you have to do is look out the bloody window. You're seen with Bill Hayden a great deal these days. Jealous, George? You've got his job. Your control's high, Chamberlain. What more do you want? Long as it lasts. <laughs> say you write the reports. I thought that was Roy's job. No, Bland makes the translations. You write the covering reports. They're typed on your machine. The material's not cleared for typists. Percy Alleline won't do. Is that the premise? Which means that Merlin won't do either. Poor old Control. He isn't a pickle. Merlin would do if he were my source, wouldn't he? If dazzling bloody Bill here potted along and said he looked a whacking big fish and wanted to play him alone and sod the expense, what would happen then? Control would say, that's very nifty of you, Bill boy. You do it just the way you want, Bill boy. Have some filthy jasmine tea. He'd be giving me a medal now, instead of sending you snooping round corridors. <sighs> we used to be rather a classy bunch. Why are we so vulgar these days? He thinks Percy's on the make. So he is. I also want to be head boy. 
And Toby and Roy have designs on your spot. Since when was ambition an offense in our beastly outfit? Is Anne at home? Send her out to play while you grill your old buddy. Who runs him, Bill? Percy? Who do you think? Carla runs him. Stands out a mile. Lower class bloke with upper class sources. Must be a bounder. Bill. Percy is sold out to Carla. Only possible explanation. Percy is our house mole. I meant who runs Merlin? Who is Merlin? What's going on? This is a callow, isn't it? It's nice, very nice. Bill. Doesn't anyone think my nose should be out of joint? I'm supposed to be in charge of the Russian target. Given it my best years. Set up networks, talent spotters, all mod cons. You chaps on the top floor have forgotten what it's like to run an operation where it takes you three days to post a letter and you don't even get an answer for your trouble. That's hardly fair to control. You've heard him a hundred times on how he detests the glamour boy agents who hog the budget. How he hates miracles if they put the bread and butter networks out of focus. It's a pity he doesn't have the same hatred of failure. Has he lived with it too long? Face it, George. It's Percy. Percy's success. It's throne control. And me, a bit. Trouble is, my networks haven't been good enough. This is new. I fancy this very much. Anne gave it me. Making amends? Probably. Must have been quite a sin. How is she? George, cut the cord. Get away from control. He's cut you out of his life for weeks on end, dispatching you about with errands a probationer could handle. What's he doing up there? He's been going through files of old circus folk heroes from year minus one, half of them under the earth already. Sniffing out the dirt to see who was pink, who was a queen. He's given us all up, hasn't he? I don't think that's true. Senile paranoia. Control's going potty. And he's also dying. It's just a question of which gets him first. And within six months of Bill Hayden's diagnosis, Control was indeed dead. And what killed him? Operation Witchcraft or Operation Testify? Neither. But it's not been melodramatic. Control would disapprove. He died of old age, a little early. But Testify destroyed his function in life, which was a form of murder. I don't have nearly enough on Testify, Peter. Would you please, uh... Of course, George.
is her. Ever such a rough voice. Says it's someone from your garage, and I can quite believe it. Right. Your rude mechanic has some bad news for you. Personally, I find mechanics are bad news, by and large. Which phone, Alwyn? The one on the left. <laughs> well, at least get onto the head office today and find out when they can supply the damn thing. Hang on a minute. I think I got the number. Alvin, sling that bag across for me, will you please? I will, sir. There you go. Open it for you. Oh, thanks. Right, are you ready? The number you want is 437-6299. It seems to be going according to plan. Thank you. But it does sound jumpy. He might have overdone it a bit there. He was very loud. I've seen it happen before. Tough ones who crack at 40. They lock it all away, pretend it isn't happening, and all of a sudden you find them at the desks, the tears pouring on the blotter. I thought I ought to say what's on my mind. I think Peter will manage. You heard something about his murderous assignment in French North Africa, I suppose. Oh, something. Whispers. Peter was overmatched and he lost. His agents were hanged. No one recovers entirely from that sort of thing. That is, I wouldn't trust a man who did. Bag, please. Peter, I am sorry to disturb you, but we have a tiny crisis. Percy Allerlein would like a word with you. Quite an urgent word. Can you come now? Of course, Toby. Have you been waiting? Didn't you tell Mr. Esterhazy where I was? We've only just got here, Peter. Your office told us you were doing a spot of devilling. Only, uh, Percy is anxious to speak to you now, you see. So, Alwyn, there's a midday shuttle to Brixton, isn't there? Yes. You might get transported buzz and ask them to take that thing over for me, will you? Will do, sir. Will do. Percy wants to consult you.
Well now, young Peter Gwillem, welcome to my house. About which you've been making calls, I hear. Are you lonely in the Brixton outposts? Tired of chasing the local virgins? If there are any in Brixton, which I would doubt. <laughs> if you'll excuse my freedom, Mo. You do know that Mo Delaware is our new head of research, do you? Man with message and cleft stick does reach Brixton, does he? Barring the monsoon. I hear you've been hobnobbing with the late lamented Ricky Tarr, formerly of your section, dispatched by you to Lisbon, and since then listed by this service as a defector. How is he? That's right, Chief. Ricky and I have tea at Fortnum's every afternoon. Jasmine. Peter Gwillem. I may not be aware of this, but I am possessed of an extremely forgiving nature. I positively seethe with goodwill. All I require from you is the matter of your discussion with Tar. I do not ask for his head or any other part of his offensive anatomy, and I will restrain my impulse personally to strangle him or you. I would even go so far as to consider bringing you back into the palace from hateful Brixton, where presently you linger in well-earned obscurity. In that case, I can't wait for him to turn up. And there's a free pardon for your friend Ricky. Until I get my hands on him. I'll tell him that word for word. He'll be thrilled. I'm very disappointed in you, young Peter. I pay you honest money, and you stab me in the back. I consider that extremely poor reward for keeping you alive against the entreaties of my advisers, I may tell you. Let us begin again. If you won't give me a straight answer, perhaps you'll unburden to somebody more persuasive. Roy. <coughs> Ricky Tarr's got a daughter, hasn't he? Yes, calls her Danny. Talk about her a lot? He told me he was fond of her. That's all I know. What the hell are you shrugging at us like that for? I'm accusing you of playing hooky behind my back with a damn defector from your own damn section? of playing damn fool parlor games and you don't know the stakes, and all you do is shrug at me. There's a law, Gwillem, against consorting with enemy agents. Do you want me to throw the book at you? I haven't seen him. Who's playing games? Not me. You are, so get off my back. Who's Dennis mother? Eurasian girl. But Tar likes to think she passes for full European. And the child. Twelve years old, long blonde hair, brown eyes, slim. Is that Danny? It could be. So, if I told you that Danny and her mother were due to arrive in London three days ago on a direct flight from Tunis, I take it you would share our perplexity? Yes, I would. And you'd keep your mouth shut when we let you out of here. It isn't ordinary flight information, Peter. The source is very private. Ultra, ultra sensitive, in fact, Peter. In that case, Toby, I'll try and keep my mouth ultra, ultra shut. So, what do you make of it, young Peter? Come on. You were his boss, guide, philosopher, friend. Tell me why Ricky Tarr's in London. You didn't say that. You said his girl and his kid were expected. Don't be obtuse, man. Where little Danny goes, there goes Tarr. Except he'd move first and have his impedimenta follow. Yes? That would be favorite. All right. Tarr was supposed to be sitting in Moscow. 
And now he's supposed to be back here on the Russian payroll. But why is it all so hot? What kind of plant can he be when we know everything about him? Down to his last attack of swine fever, from which he's only partially recovered, in my view. Excuse my freedom, Mo. I'm sorry, but what kind of plant is that? Well, never mind what sort. Muddying pools, poisoning wells, maybe that damn sort. Pulling the rug out. Now, listen. Just you remember this. At the first peep, the first whisper of Ta or his lady or his wee bairn, young Peter Gwillem, you come to one of us grown-ups. Anyone you see at this table. But not another damn soul. The name on the passport is Poole, P-double-O-L-E, all three of them. Ta told his woman, so we understand, in case of difficulties, she should come to you. Sign that, Peter, would you? Stupid bloody cabaret. Percy gets more insufferable every day. Peter, ta, bastard ta. Peter, slow down. Slow down. The file on testify seemed a bit thin. I hope it was worth the sweat. Ricky Tar's not lied to us, Peter, not in any material way. He's simply done what agents the world over do, fail to tell us the whole story. On the other hand, he has been rather clever. Are you actually pleased with him? Well, yes. We now know that Source Merlin works to Moscow Center because that's where Merlin's information on Ricky Tower must have come from. From Carla. He's been a lot better today, so not nearly so uh, nervy. Well, he did his football pools this morning, and this afternoon uh, we planted some trees in the garden, and then uh, this evening we had a nice game of cards. Has he been out alone? Oh, no, Mr. Smith. Use the telephone? I wouldn't dare, sir. Has he talked about his daughter, Danny, or her mother? Well, uh, he did over the weekend, sir, but uh, well, he's sort of cooled off about them since. I think it's in view of the emotional side. Did he ever mention any arrangements for meeting them again? Anything about passports? No, sir. What has he talked about, for God's sake? Well, mostly the Russian lady, say, Irina. Oh, he mentions her name a lot, Irina. He likes to read a diary. He says he's going to make Moscow Center swap the mole for Irina when the mole's been caught and all this has been cleared up. And then, uh, and then he's going to buy a little place in Scotland. Oh, and he says he'll see me right, too. Get me a big job in the circus. I, uh... I just listen, of course. Right. You don't post those football pool coupons, do you, Ford? Oh, no, Mr. Smiley. Well, let's hope he doesn't have a win. That would be expensive for us. Thank you for your help, Miss Brimley. Sorry to impose on you. He's gone to bed.
I must ask you once more, what did you do with the two Swiss escape passports you took with you to Lisbon? I told you, burn them. When you bought your fake British passport in Istanbul, a passport for yourself in the name of Richard Henry Poole, did you buy any others from the same source? Why? Why should I? To protect your child and her mother. That seems quite reasonable. After all, it wouldn't be a very gallant act to leave the woman and the child you love to the mercy of the Moscow hood on your tail while you escape to all this VIP protection. It's horrible to think of. Truly horrible to contemplate the lengths Carla might go to in order to obtain your silence or your services. But perhaps what you actually did, and forgot to tell us about, was to burn the British passports you obtained for Mrs. Poole and Miss Danny Poole, but kept your own to convince Carla's footpads you thought it was still safe. Then, probably, you made travel bookings in the name of the Poole family for the same reason. You doctored the Swiss passports for Danny and her mother and made other arrangements for them, like um, staying in Marseille, perhaps. Prince. I don't know where they are, but I'm sure no harm has come to them. Does that satisfy you? Maybe you should keep a closer eye on your own damn woman and leave mine alone. No, Peter. Perhaps it's just as well. I shouldn't know where you've hidden them, so long as you don't try to communicate. Unless, of course, you want me to help in some way, money or whatever. No need. Let's trust each other, shall we? Are we friends again, Mr. Gwillem? It won't be long now. Have you got all you need? Can I have my gun back? Yes. Oh, why not, Peter? I told you he'd been clever. A little bit of the truth is indispensable in the games agents play, you know that. Ricky put his family in safekeeping and found his own way home. He fooled the Russians. If Carla had a deal with him, do you think you and I would be alive and well and living in hope? Not by now, I think. <laughs> Let it breathe a little. Oh, well, just leave it. We'll pour it when we're ready. <coughs> Does anyone know Carla's real name? And how old is he? Another mystery. Decades of his life unaccounted for. So many of the people he's worked with have a way of dying off. He was in England in 1936 and 41, that's documented. We can assume it was sometime during that period he recruited our mole, Gerald. I met him once in Delhi. Oh, this was long before we came to know him as the legendary Carla. 
In the mid-50s, Moscow Center was in pieces on the floor, wholesale purgings and shootings. And as a result, defection everywhere. I became a kind of commercial traveler. The whole world was my territory. Inspecting the goods, fixing the terms, disposing as seemed best, on London's instructions, of course. Well, I found myself off to India, where the authorities had arrested, at our request, on some trumped-up immigration nonsense, a Mr. Guestman. Carla's name at that time. He was on his way back to Moscow from San Francisco. Except that he didn't know when he left California that he was Moscow bound. He'd been told to rendezvous with a TAS correspondent in Delhi. The message from the TAS man was an aeroplane ticket and don't ask me any questions, comrade. Carla was in disgrace. Summoned and doomed. There were two other things he didn't know. The first was that we'd intercepted the radio signal directing him to Delhi. The second was that the San Francisco network he'd organized had been rolled up hide and hair the day he left. Could we take those things off his hands? I only have to shout for you, don't I? Mr. Guestman, you are the Cold War orphan. If you go home to Moscow as ordered, you'll be either shot or sent to die in one of the camps. Wouldn't you prefer to ask us for protection? We have no powers of permanent arrest, and our arrangement with the Americans was that they hit your agents and we make you this invitation. I can't see an alternative for you. If you cooperate, we can give you a new start, a new identity. Seclusion, a modest amount of money. So why don't you start by telling me your true name? Would you like a cigarette? I know you're a chain smoker. Oh, please. I know this is what you smoke. Look, I'm not offering you wealth or smart women or your choice of fast cars. I know you haven't any use for those things. And I'm not going to make any claims about the moral superiority of the West. I'm sure you can see through our values, just as I can see through yours in the East. You and I have spent our lives looking for the weaknesses in each other's systems. I'm sure each of us has experienced innumerable technical satisfactions in our wretched Cold War. But now your own side is going to shoot you for nothing, for misdemeanors you have not committed because of a power struggle within your own hierarchy because, probably, of someone's treachery or sheer incompetence. I'm sure both of us, when we were young, 
subscribe to great visions. But not anymore. After all you've seen. You can't still be committed to that old grand design. You know it's achieved nothing except new forms of the old misery. Don't destroy yourself. Not worth it. Do you know where your wife is? I mean, at this moment. You have to think about her. She'll have to make a new life. Did you have a friend? One really good friend who could look after her. Perhaps we could get in touch with her secretly. If you stay with us, we might be able to arrange something. An exchange for someone your people want returned. But if you go back, it can do her nothing but harm. She'll be cold-shouldered, suspected. The best she can hope for is to be allowed to see you before you're shot. Another meaningless firing squad. Guard. What did Control have to say when you got back? I hope to God they do shoot him. But they didn't. His boss was the one who faced the firing squad, as it turned out. Mr. Gerstmann survived and thrived. How he thrived. He went on to build his legend and become the Carla we know. The Carla who all the time he sat looking at me was no doubt thinking of Gerald the Mole. Have you noticed, Peter, that whenever I really trouble one of our acquaintances with my questions, he will raise the matter of my failure as a husband to confound me? Instructive. Ricky Tarr tried it twice. Unimportant in his case, spite. Well, that was sumptuous. That boy Fawn, good at his judo, isn't he? Karate, George. Judo is what Fawn would call just your little cuddle, Mr. Smiley. I don't think even Toby Esterhase's people would follow us here. The food's well below the standard they've come to expect. So, Carla's fireproof. He can't be bought and he can't be beaten. Not fireproof, because he's a fanatic. I may have behaved like a soft dolt, the very archetype of a flabby Western liberal, but I'd rather be my kind of fool than his. One day, that lack of moderation will be Carla's downfall. He's 
never touched radio since the debacle in San Francisco. Cut it right out of his handwriting. His agent aren't allowed to hear it. That's something else you and Carla have in common. Yes, I am prejudiced against radio men. Tiresome breed, overstrung, unreliable. What's the other thing? Well, the cigarette lighter. I assume he still has it. As far as I know, he does. Sorry, George. Not at all. How do you feel, Peter? I'm all right. After Delhi, you know, Control gave me three months' leave without the option. When this is over, I hope you'll take it easy for a while. We are not quite there, but nearly. Peter, have you got the handbrake on? Operation Witchcraft, all aligned to minister. Extremely secret and personal. We spoke. Merlin, as you may have known for some time, is not one source, but several. It would do the treasury no harm to learn, because he was enjoying himself, wasn't he? To learn that Merlin's 10,000 Swiss francs a month in salary and a similar figure for expenses and running costs are scarcely excessive when the cloth has to be cut so many ways. Then he adds, Nevertheless, I regard it as paramount that knowledge of the London house and the purpose for which it is used remain absolutely at a minimum. Well, in a sense, Percy Allerline's quite right about Merlin. Of course, Merlin represents several sources, various departments of Moscow Centre, with Carla queuing them in on the basis of the most timely material of the given moment. Sometimes he likes to direct Circus' attention to a topical subject, sometimes to deflect it. For example, after Ricky Tarr's encounter with Irina in Lisbon, Merlin delivered some vivid insights on the ideological penetration of the United States. But Carla doesn't know what Tarr's done with the information from Irina. Which brings us to your interrogation by Aline and his reference to Tar's probable role over here in muddying pools, etc. Merlin's message on Tar, I suggest, was that Ricky would be trying to sell to someone in London, on Carla's behalf, fictitious material about a traitor in the circus. Nothing muddier than that, is there? Remember, Merlin is totally believed. So now we have a clear connection between Merlin and the Mole. And at the heart of this beautifully symmetrical plot is a house in London for which the Treasury paid £60,000. Plus another ten for making it more to Merlin's liking, or Gerald's. Fascinating, George. Thank you. And how do you suggest I explain to my minister, least painfully, that Merlin's a fraud and he'll have to tell the Americans so? 
He's devoted to Merlin. Impress upon him that whatever he's buying from the Americans with Merlin's discredited currency is going straight to Moscow via Gerald the Mole. That should do the trick. This document is not one you've asked me to bring. It arrived only today. Source unknown. According to a recently released prisoner from Lubyanka jail, Moscow's center held a secret execution in the punishment block in March. The victims were three of its own functionaries. All were shot in the back of the neck. One was a woman. Ricky Tyre mustn't know. It's vital he gets no wind of this. God knows what he'd do or not do if he found out Irina was dead. And we may need to make further use of him. Do you really believe all that guff about Tar being in love with her? The little homestead in the Highlands, the avenging lover, the honourable Ricky Tar? He may feel compelled, Peter. Everybody has a loyalty somewhere. He mustn't know. I agree. Now, George, I've wrote all I could find on Jim Prido, such as it is. Thank you. Prido and Bill Hayden were really very close, you know. Realized. Yes. Thank you. Operation Testify. We still need to understand what happened, or rather, why it happened. The file you borrowed, Peter, does at least give us a nudge in the right direction. I think I know who to talk to next. Your day was hardly wasted. I am glad of that, George. We've traced Preto. He's become a teacher. First good preparatory school for boys. It's in the West Country. Right. Second time round. Sir, how long? Now then, Jumbo. See that man? Who's he then? Seen him before? No, sir. Anybody seen him before? No, no sir. sir. He's not staff and he's not village, so who is he? Beggar man? Thief? Tinker tailor, soldier sailor. Rich Great man, man poor man, man, beggar man, man thief. thief. Why doesn't he look this way? Something funny about that. Here's a bunch of boys burning up a car around the playing field and he doesn't even give them a glance. You would, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. Doesn't he like boys? Doesn't he like cars? Doesn't even look at that car. Best Britain ever made and years out of production. Right, gather on. Come on. Right, now, anybody sees him again, let me know. Or any other sinister bodies, understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't want juju men wandering around, pretending they don't know we exist. First glimpse, tell me, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, Jumbo, I don't hold with odd bods wandering around a school. Last place I was at, we had a whole gang broke in. Cleared the place out. House cups, money, boys, watches. Nothing sacred to types like that. We don't want to swiping the Alvis. Words are irreplaceable, thanks to socialism. Color of hair, Jumbo? Sort of light colored, sir. Height? About the same as you, sir. Age? Well, hard to say, really, sir. Go as it was at that distance. You'd know him again, Jumbo, for sure. 
Best watcher in the unit, Jumbo Roaches, eh? As long as he keeps his specs clean. It's you, Jumbo. Oh, my legs, sir. Oh, dear. Right. Can you get up? Now, slowly. Slowly. Fell off the bricks, did you, Jumbo? Let's have a look. Ah, uh, nothing broken. Just a graze. Matron will soon put that right. One thing gives you a good excuse for getting in late. Missing even song. Tripped over in the lane. Is that what you tell her? We've got a secret, haven't we? I can trust you, I know that. We're good at keeping secrets, loners like you and me. Is it because of that man? 
Would you shoot him? Are you working undercover like Bulldog Drummond in the book? Some of the boys wanted to call you Bulldog, but we thought Rhino was better. Bigger than a Bulldog. I, uh, I used to be a soldier, Jumbo. What you saw just now, that's a souvenir. You know, it's like this. How I got it, they're both secrets. I keep them to myself. You understand, don't you, Jumbo, eh? Yes, sir. Knew you would. Knew you would. Good night, Jumbo. Good night, sir. Thank you, sir. Time no see. Hello, sir. Care for it? Let him present. <laughs> Better than selling washing machines, anyway. It's a bit odd putting the dinner jacket on at 10 o'clock in the morning, of course. Reminds me of a diplomatic cover, come to think of it. or not, it's straight, which makes a change. We get all the help we need from the arithmetic. I'm sure you do. My employers might let me invest a few pennies of my own before too long. They're tough boys, but very go ahead, you know. Rather like we were in the old days. So, what can I do for you? I want to talk to you about the night Jim Prido was shot. The night of Operation Testify, which was what it was called, in case you didn't know. Oh, writing your memoirs, George? We are reopening the case. Who's this we, oh boy? Lacon called me in, with the minister's blessing. I can give you a telephone number to confirm, although I'd prefer not. All power corrupts, but some must govern, and in that case, Brother Lakin will reluctantly scramble to the top of the heap. The record's been filleted. Of what there is on the file, the most useful piece of information is that you were duty officer that night. Yes. Yes, I'd just come back from Tokyo, a three-year stint. Nobody seemed to have any plans for me, so I thought I'd push off to the south of France for a month's leave. And then old Mendel, Control's minder, picked me up in the passage and marched me off to see Control. The whole place felt weird. There was nobody about except the radio and code people. That Harridan, Molly somebody or other, was monitoring a busy little body. Molly Purcell. You were in Berlin, Bill Hayden was up country, and Percy Annaline was in Scotland. Control seemed to have cleared the decks. My God, he was a shock. I'd heard he wasn't his old self anymore, but I hadn't been prepared for this. It was like opening a coffin lid. He didn't waste time on any pleasantries. I need somebody good to man the switchboard. It's got to be an old hand. I could bring in somebody from one of the outstations, but you're better, because you've been away for so long, away from the infighting and the vendettas around this place. You don't know what I'm talking about. That's good. Just do exactly what I tell you. could be a crisis tonight. I've got a man doing a special job. It's of the utmost importance to the service. The service, it's for us. It could change everything for us. Your job tonight is to act as cut out. Cut out between me and whatever goes on in the rest of the building. If anything comes in, radio signal, phone call, letter, anything at all, no matter how trivial it seems. You want to wait. Wait until the coast is clear and then bring it straight to me by hand, Sam. You don't use the internal phones. You don't put anything down on paper for future reference. 
Is that understood? And when it's all over, you're not to breathe a word about it. Never. Not to anybody, not to Smiley, not to Hayden, not to Bland, nobody. What if I have to send out something? Only what I tell you. The defensive weaknesses have, I think, cost them the match, which could now be sewn up by Paul Mariner. Or by Woods. Two are still down. All by Muren. All by Walk. And in the end, by none of them. Unbelievable. And Paul Mariner is completely flat. And he deserves a great deal better than that because I think by Shea, he's my man of the match. Studio officer. Mm. All right. Yes, I see. Yeah, well, I have to call you back. It all sounds very unlikely. Collins, this is urgent. Well, it's open. There's all hell broken out in the Czechoslovak air. Half of it's coded, but there's enough that isn't. Proud or Brunner? Brunner. Yes? All right, Molly, keep listening. President Clark from the Foreign Office came on first with a story from Reuters, head man in London. Molly picked the same thing up on the radio. And Reuters and a couple of Fleet Street papers have already had another go at the Foreign Office. They're saying that a British spy has been shot in Brunner. The Czechs are telling the world about an act of gross provocation by a Western power. They haven't named the dead man yet. Can I have a brief, please? Control, I need a brief. We must say something. Do you want me to deny it? A, a, a flat denial, just to start with. Do you want me to get someone else in? Do you want to come downstairs and handle it yourself? It's deniable he had foreign documents. No one could know he was British at this stage. There hasn't been time, even if he's not dead. Find Smiley. He's in Berlin.
Yes. Well, anyone will do. It makes no difference. Tell Mendel to get me a taxi. You sent Mendel home. been named. Hello? Hello. Uh, hello. Is that Mrs. Smiley? George Smiley's house, just in case his wife happened to know where you were. You are a friend of the family, aren't you? I saw the ticker tape at the club. I gather there's been some god-awful shooting party. Tell me, Czechoslovakia, right? Jim prido has been shot. The Czechs haven't got his real name yet. They're using his work name, Ellis. Jim. Shot dead. Well, we're not sure that was the first flash. Since then, the word used is simply shot. What the Czechs are saying that Prido, what hell is, travelling on false papers and assisted by Czech counter-revolutionaries, tried to kidnap a Czech general unnamed in a forest near Brunner and smuggle him over the Austrian border. They say that further arrests are imminent. Go on. Well, according to our military, there are heavy Czech tank movements along the Austrian border. laken has been on, and so's the minister. They want to know what the hell and why. Now, I have put out emergency calls to Smiley, Alaline, Bland. I'm glad to see you. I'm sorry, Bill. All right, Sam. Now, first thing we do... You call this number. It's Toby Esterhazy. Tell him you're speaking from me, and he's to pick up the two check agents we've had our eyes on at the London School of Economics, and lock them up. Now. Straight away, Sam. Jim's worth a lot more than those two, but it's a start. I have a word with the Chief Hood at the Czech Embassy. If they hurt a hair of Jim Prido's head, I'll strip the entire Czech network in this country there. And he can pass that on to his master. I'll make him the laughing stock of the profession. I'm bound to say Hayden was a treat to watch. I used to think of him as a pretty erratic sort of devil. Not that night, believe me. He virtually dictated a press statement for the Foreign Office to put out. And there it was, the following morning in the Sunday papers. Prague Radio's sensational revelations dismissed with dignified scorn. I found it good like reading over breakfast at the Savoy. And then you went to the south of France? Two lovely months. Did anyone question you again? Percy Alaline. Well, 
He was acting chief by then. You were out on your ear and control was in hospital. Percy wants to know how I'd come to be doing duty officer on the fateful night. That chap Masterman was down for it. Well, I told him what I'd put to Masterman, that I'd know that a kip and a quiet weekend in the circus would save me a bit of spending money for the south of France. Percy said I was a liar. And that's why they sacked you, for fibbing. Alcoholism. There were five empty beer cans in the duty officer's waste paper basket. Well, there's a standing order against booze on the premises. So what was your offence, George? Oh, I couldn't convince them that I wasn't involved. Oh, well, if you want anyone's throat cut, give me a buzz. Sam, listen. It was too late for Hayden's club to be still running ticker tape, wasn't it? He was making love to Anne that night. You made a guess at that and you were right. You telephoned her, she told you he wasn't there, and then as soon as you'd rung off, she pushed him out of bed. And Bill turned up an hour later, knowing about Chekhov. But you didn't tell Anne about Chekhov. find my own way down. Mind how you go, George. Not on your own. I swear I'll break your neck. Quite alone, Jim. God damn you, George. What the hell do you want? I'm sorry, Jim, but I have to know what happened. I'm finished, man. They told me to draw the line. I've drawn it. How do you like schoolmastering? I think you had a spell of it after the war, didn't you? Was that at a prep school? Don't come round here playing cat and mouse with me, George Smarney. Look at the file. Circus file? Not available to me, Jim. I'm blackballed. Hard luck. I've had access to a few papers, which Lacon borrowed for me. Pretty old stuff. Part of it went right back to your undergraduate days when you and Bill Hayden met at Oxford. There's a letter Bill wrote about you to his tutor, Fanshaw, circus talent spotter, in which Bill named you as suitable material for British intelligence. I can quote the odd line from memory. He has that heavy quiet that commands. He's my other half. Between us, we'd make one marvellous man. He asks nothing better than to be in my company or that of my wicked divine friends and I'm vastly tickled by the compliment. He's virgin, about eight foot tall, and built by the same firm that did Stonehenge. Christ. Oh, Christ, man, there were children. Yes, of course. What do you want to know? I thought we could at least be comfortable while we talk. It doesn't matter.
came round in a prison hospital. Barred windows, high up. They operated after a fashion. Next time I came round, I was in a prison cell, no windows at all. I tried to work out a plan of campaign to meet the interrogation. I knew I'd never be able to keep quiet. No chance of that. If I was to stay sane, and possibly even survive, there'd have to be dialogue. At the end, they'd have to believe I told them all I knew. I decided I'd give them my version of Operation Testify first. The one control spelled out for me. I was head of scalp hunters. I mounted my own campaign without the knowledge of my superiors because I wanted to prove I was worth promotion. If I could believe that, I could bury deep inside myself all thoughts of a traitor inside the circus. No mole. No meeting with control. No Tinker Taylor. I was there to turn General Stefchek and just that. Then I thought I could throw them the names of one or two other Soviet and satellite officials who'd been turned recently. I might even give them the rundown of my entire Brixton stable. Anything, so long as I forgot the mole and Tinker Taylor and kept myself our check networks. You know, I recruited the founder members. Yes, a fine piece of work. And that's the joke. They couldn't care less about the networks. Knew it all. Rolled them up, have they? <laughs> they? Knew damn well that Testify was my private brainchild. I began exactly where I wanted to end, with the briefing in St. James's. All they wanted to talk about was Control's rotten apple theory, Tinker Taylor, the circus spy. Did they actually know the address of the St. James's flat? Yeah, they knew the brand of the sherry. What about the charts? Controls charts on General Stevchek's career. Do they know about those? No. Not at first. Tell me about the uh, networks. Did anyone get out? No. It seems they were shot. The story is you blew them to save your own skin. I know that isn't true, of course. They move me about a lot. Different rooms, different prisons, depending on who was doing the interrogating and what methods they wanted to use. It's quite a lot of muscle. Electrical, most of it. Yes, movement. Cars, lorries, corridors, cells. Once in a plane, I was hooded for it and passed out soon after takeoff. Punished for that. <laughs> Think I was in Russia part of the time. Would you like to stretch your legs? Might help. Went straight to the heart of it. Why did Control go it alone? What did he hope to achieve? His comeback, I said. I got a laugh. The tin pot information about Czecho military emplacements wouldn't get him a square meal at his club. So, I said, maybe poor old Control was losing his grip. 
That bored them. Back to the cooler. Punished again. No, they knew how to stop that. They left me alone for a couple of days. Got me ready for the long run. That was when I... gave... gave them what they wanted. It's a matter of health as much as anything. Yes, you don't break exactly. You just run out of stories to tell. I'd reached the point the things I'd locked away deep down were the only things coming into my brain. That was when I told them about Control's charts on Stefchik. And also about Control's rotten apple theory. Yes, the mole. The code names we'd worked out for Control's suspects. Tinker, Percy Allerline. Taylor, Bill Hayden. Soldier, Roy Bland. Poor man, Toby Estehazy. Beggar man, George Smiley. What was the reaction? He thought for a bit, then he offered me a cigarette. Who did? What? Oh, sorry. By this stage, there was some frosty, bearded fellow left. Seemed to be a head boy, just him and a couple of guards standing back a bit while he made his kill. I hated that damn cigarette. Why? It was a foul American thing, Camel, actually. I remember the packet. Did he smoke them? Never stopped. And was that the end of it? More or less, more or less, yes. I have to know everything, Jim. The rest was just gossip. He wanted to know a lot of circus tittle-tattle, who was going up, who was going down, a lot of tripe. About what? Who? Bland. How much was he drinking? Esther Hazy. How could anybody trust a man who dressed like that? Not a tripe. What did he say about me? He showed me a cigarette lighter. Said it was yours. Present for man with all my love, her signature engraved. Did he tell you how he came by it? Some confrontation years ago, said you'd remember. Anything else? Oh, come on, Jim. I'm not going to weaken at the knees just because some Russian hoods made a bad joke about me. You reckon that after Bill Hayden's fling with her, she might care to redraft the inscription? I told him to his face he could go to bloody hell. You can't judge Bill by things like that. He's got different standards. He was certainly never one for regulations. And you were never one to see him straight. That's it. Everything. Bill made a huge fuss about your repatriation. He said any price was fair to get one loyal Englishman home. I remember his verdict on Control's handling of Testify, the most incompetent operation ever launched by an old man for his dying glory, and Jim Prido paid the cost of it. Proud of your memory, aren't you? Did you see Bill at all after you got back? No. Your oldest, closest friend. I was in quarantine, wasn't I? Well, yes, but never mind. Let's just go over your debriefing at Sarat to wrap it up. Were the Inquisitors sympathetic or not? Never appeared. No questions at all. I was in limbo, ate a lot, drank a lot, slept a lot. Then Toby Esterhazy turns up. 
new suit full of himself. Tells me the circus had nearly gone under because of Operation Testify, and I'm currently number one leper. Control's out of the game, and there's a reorganization going on to appease Whitehall. They sent Toby. Yes, the little charmer. He told me not to worry. About what? My special brief, whatever Control had told me. Did Toby spell it all out? He said a few people knew the real story, and I needn't worry, because it was being taken care of. All the facts were known. Were they indeed? And then he gave me a thousand quid in cash to add to my gratuity. Who from? Didn't say. Didn't all this strike you as a bit odd? No inquisition? Toby throwing loose money around? After all, through you, the Russians had discovered the exact reach of Control's suspicions about a traitor in the circus. He'd narrowed the field to five. And no one's asking you anything. The facts were known, man. Toby ordered me not to approach anyone or to try and make my story heard. The circus was back in the road. I could forget Tinker Taylor and the whole damn game. Moles, everything. Drop out, he said. You're a lucky man, Jim. Forget it, eh? Forget it. So Toby actually mentioned Tinker Taylor to you. However did he get hold of that? And that's what I've been doing. Obeying orders and forgetting. George Orbo. What an amazing thing. Trust you popping up out of nowhere. How are you, Jerry? George, this is terrific. What, what, what are you doing now? How's the demon wife? How's everything? No, no, damn it. First things first. What'll you have? You don't fancy a bottle of the bubbles, do you? Shall we? A brandy and ginger ale would suit me very well, thanks. You sure? <laughs> All right. Hey, Linda, sweetheart. G give us a double brandy, a bottle of ginger ale, and a, another bucket of gin, will you? Good girl, lad. I think I'll marry her. How many would that be, Jerry? I'm a divorce addict, a hopeless case. <laughs> Not lucky like you, George. But there's only one Anne. Now, I'll do a deal with you, an offer you can't refuse. I'll shack up with Anne and be the envy of London, and you can have my job on the comic. You've got just the turn of phrase for the women's ping pong. Inscrutable Chinese wizard attic. Do you fancy it? Is that the task for the day? Oh, much bigger stuff, old boy. Footer, the opiate of the people. Heap big transfer. 
Scottish Thunder Boots to rescue of ex-champions now on the slide. Thanks, Linda, my love. Do you want me to write it down, Mr. Westerby? Ah, uh, please, Linda. Cheers, George. Cheers. This isn't entirely a chance meeting. I got the letter you wrote me last football season. I burnt it straight away. Right. Thanks. Stupid of me. Talking out of school. Sorry. No, no, no. You obviously did what you felt was the best thing at the time, and so did I. I haven't seen many of the boys and girls lately, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I guess they put us both on the shelf. With me, I can hardly blame them. Firewater, not good for Braves. They think our blab crack up. I'm sure they don't. I expect they're just resting you up for a bit. They do that, you know. In case you've been wondering, I didn't tell anyone else about your letter. I was out of favor, indeed, out of work by then. Writing to me wasn't what put them off you, if that's what you thought. In your letter, you said you were a bit worried about Toby Esterhazy. Felt you ought to get something off your chest. Yes, well, I got all xenophobe and suspicious. Thought Toby had gone a bit haywire, as a matter of fact. I should talk. <laughs> Tell me now. You'd uh, just come back from Czechoslovakia, hadn't you? Last job I did for Tob. Looks like the last I'd ever do. Letterbox job? Yes. Uh, nothing to it, really. Telephone kiosk, ledge at the top, dump a little package ready for collection. <laughs> well, that was Budapest, the Czechoslovak thing. I ran into by accident. I had to go on to Prague, you see, for the comic. Nothing to do with Tom. Uh, Linda, sweetheart. And again, Mr. Westerby. Uh, please, my beauty. Oh, no, 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 no. You got time to eat? Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, we'll uh, go Dutch on that, shall we? I, um... <clears throat> I was in this bar in Prague. Always use it. Locals go there, all sorts. Of... Anyway, I, I got in with this crowd at a corner table. We were both playing the squeeze box. We, we were all hugger-mugger to the music. Oh, thank you, Linda, my love. <clears throat> and there's, um... There's this kid with a pudding bowl haircut. Army, obvious. Anyway, he's on leave, well in his cuffs, and he knows I'm English. And he suddenly says, do I want to know the truth about the British spy who got himself shot up by the Russian secret police? Just like that. Yells it right in my ear. I played dumb, of course, and he goes right on with it. You, you know the Jim Prido shambles. Well, the kid was belly aching about the trials and tribulations of being a foot soldier of the line. It seems as on the two nights in question, he and his mates were being chased around the place till they were dizzy. Make camp, break camp, move up, move back, fix bayonets. But the big point was the Russian contingent. Full war paint, tanks, motorbikes, tracker dogs, and a big carload of very sinister civilians. Dirty work afoot in the forest. Up near the Austrian border, this was. So, my little friend, being a sassy little devil, decides to ask his sergeant what's it all about. Look, Sarge, he says, what's going on? Are we being invaded, Sarge? No, son, says the sergeant. The Russians are after a British spy who tried to kidnap a general. Ah, uh, after? Or where after? Exactly. That's what the kid wanted to tell me. The Russians moved in on the Friday. It was the day after when they got Jim. As the kid said, they were ready and waiting for him. Knew the lot in advance. Heap bad story. Bad for our big chief. Bad for tribe. So, as soon as I got back, I went and told all to Tob. How did he take it? But to begin with, it was thanks a million, Jerry, old boy. He'd go and powwow with the top brass. And then the next morning... You're so plastered these days, you can't tell fact from fiction. You're an embarrassment. You go in a bender, drink yourself in a cloud cuckoo land, and come staggering back here with a load of tripe like this. 
You're pathetic. Now, look, old boy. I don't want to hear any excuses. I had to report what I heard. Yes, you believed every stupid word of it, didn't you? Swallowed it like... like mother's milk. A load of half-baked woomers, you come spreading them round here. What you can remember through your alcoholic haze. I didn't forget a thing. Well, you will now. You'll forget the lot. Don't you see? The boy was a plant. Provocateur, in layman's language. He was doing a job for Moscow Center. Object disruption. Make the circus chase our own tails. And you fell for it, Jerry, that's all. Okay, Tob, you know best. If you don't want the story, that's your business. I do it for the paper. You what? Not the bit about the Russians getting there first, of course not, but the rest of it's all good stuff. The story wasn't covered very well at the time, just the official statement. Now, if old Jerry gets himself a splash about the day the Czechs mobilized for the Third World War, except it was one lone Englishman surrounding him all by himself, and that's a good piece. <laughs> Comic might even run an ad on the telly. Well, the day after that, I was called for by the editor. The editor, I mean, not the sports bloke. He tells me some clown has been on the phone with a formal warning. Keep that baboon, Westerby, off the Czech spy story. Any further reference against the national interest? End of message. <laughs> Sir, I didn't get the report of the year award. <laughs> Can't, can you, when your story's on the spike? Cheers. But you didn't spike it entirely. I mean, you wrote to me. Dropped the letter in by hand. Must have been the same day you talked to Toby Esterhazy. Yes, well, as I say at the time, it just felt odd. My mistake, old boy. When I heard you'd got the heave-ho anyway, I felt an even bigger damn fool. I thought it was you who phoned the editor, you see. It wasn't. Of course not. Sorry, old one. Nothing untoward going on, is it, old boy? I mean, tribe hasn't gone on the rampage or anything. <laughs> but are you hunting alone? I mean, I, I know I'm not the brightest, but... You start asking questions, there's got to be something. <laughs> what I'm saying is, any time I want. Thank you, Jerry. Rum chap, Toby Esther Hezzy. But good. My God, first rate, brilliant, my view, but rum. Don't forget to give my love to Anne, will you? One of the great marriages that always sets so. Oh, come on, Jerry, out with it. Did Toby say something about Anne? Some story had gone. I told him to stuff it up his silk drawers. <laughs> prepared for something like this. Take on a temporary, the last thing you expect is loyalty. Well done, that boy. We're going to lose this match. So much for Prido's coaching. I'm absolutely...
Absolutely furious with that man. It's monstrous to clear off. Did he say what's wrong with his mother? No, he did not. She is supposed to be dying. Well, that's one excuse for absence that he can hardly use again. Not at all, Mother. It's quite the reverse. One false alarm can easily lead to another. I shall ask for a full medical diagnosis next time. front row forwards of theirs look over age to me. Did he ever tell you how he got that awful shoulder? Oh, fell off a bus with a bottle of vodka. What? Fell off a bus with a bottle of vodka inside him, I shouldn't wonder. I suppose I shall have to take his French. Oh, come on, that's good! Be tough! He's gone in the hour because he'd never trust any other form of transport. But if he'd gone for good, he wouldn't leave the caravan behind, would he? Stands to reason, that. Besides, he'd have said goodbye properly, Rhino would. Wouldn't just go, not Rhino. Not like a juju man. Come about the furs. Hello, Toby. Peter. Exactly five star, but then we are shopping a bit down market. Safe houses I have now. Take the weight off your feet, it won't be long. So we're expecting a pole, are we, Peter? A pole in the fur trade you think I might like to take on as a courier? I'd like him on my own payroll for preference. It looks useful. But what's the point? My lads are underemployed as it is. Very generous of you, Peter. Uh, stay put, Toby. Sorry about this, Toby. Against the wall, Tobe! Did he come alone, or is there some little friend waiting down in the square? Looks all clear to me, sir. Go back to the other room. Don't take your eyes off the street. You've seen something? Turn the light out a moment.
Just a shadow, I suppose. Yes, I think so. I want to put a thesis to you, Toby, about what's been going on. Let's cast our minds back, say, about 18 months, when Control is still with us. Percy Allerline wants his job, everyone knows that. But although Control is sick and past his prime, Percy can't dislodge him. It's a time of uneasiness in the circus. Morale is low, activity is low, yes? I remember, George. Well, Percy's door opens one day and one of our senior men walks in. We'll call him Gerald. Well, it's just a name. And Gerald says, Percy, I've stumbled on a major source of Russian intelligence. It could be a gold mine. Perhaps they take a walk in the park or drive in a car, but whatever, Percy listens. Because what Gerald goes on to say is music in Percy's ears. Some of us, Gerald tells him, are worried sick about the state the circus has got into. I mean, look at our operational losses. Agents, networks. He's careful not to suggest there's a traitor inside the circus, but he emphasizes that slovenliness at the top is leading to failure all round. That is to say, it's all control's fault. My thesis, you understand. Sure, George. Another notion is that Percy Allerline was his own Gerald, that he went out and bought himself a top Russian spy and manned his own boat from then on, but I don't believe that's what happened. I think he'd mess it up, don't you? Sure, George. So the next thing is for Gerald to say to Percy, I and a little group of like-minded friends want you to be our father figure, Percy. We are not political men. We don't know our way in the Whitehall jungle, but you do. Did you bring a babysitter, Toby? George, why should I? I came to meet Peter and some pole in the fur trade. Do you want Fawn to go down and have a look? No, need him here. Can't take the chance. Yes, well, Gerald says that if Percy will handle the committees, he and his friends will handle Merlin. Merlin being the Moscow intelligence source and witchcraft, the name of the material he supplies. And how well it all worked. Merlin's material proved excellent, as everyone agreed, except Control. And eventually Control was out and Percy was king. So what's new, George? Ever bought a fake picture, Toby? Sold a couple once. The more you pay for it, the less inclined you are to doubt its authenticity. Merlin's price was 20,000 francs a month into a Swiss bank, according to the file. Oh, yes, Toby, this is official. There came the day when Gerald admitted Percy to the greatest secret of all, that the Merlin set up as a London end. Alexei Alexandrovich Polyakov. Cultural attaché at the Russian Embassy in London. You're on record as grading him snow white, Toby. Quite untainted with the mischief of espionage. In fact, he's Merlin's London representative. That's a start, I should tell you now, of a very clever knot. Now, everything to do with witchcraft is secret, of course, but inevitably a lot of people are involved. Transcribers, translators, codists, evaluators, God knows what. Doesn't worry Gerald, of course. He likes it. Because the art of being Gerald is to be one of a crowd. But when it comes to Polyakov, that's a different story. Who knows it? Only you, Roy Bland, Bill Hayden, and Percy. Three of you and Alali. You're the magic circle. 
Who meets him, Toby? For God's sake, let me sweat the bastard. You all meet him. How's that? Percy represents the authoritarian side, asks after his wife, suggests it's time he took a little holiday. Very paternal, Percy would be. Bill Hayden, I think, would see Polyakov much more often. Bill's a Russian expert, for one thing, and he's good entertainment value. I'd expect Bill to shine when it comes to the briefings and follow-up sessions, making sure the right messages went back to Moscow. Roy Bland's good on economics, as well as being top man on the satellite countries, so he'd have plenty to chat about. Then there's you, Toby. You'd have your solo sessions with Polyakov, because there's tradecraft to discuss, and all those little snippets about goings-on inside the embassy, which are very much your field. And if the magic circle wanted Polyakov to do some photography inside the embassy, it would be you who would supply the film. Replenish his stock from time to time. Take him. Little sealed packets. Toby, you wouldn't be lying, would you? Did you bring a babysitter? Across my heart, George, I swear to you. What would you use for a job like this? Cars? No. On foot. Keep walking them through. How many? Eight. Ten, maybe. What about one man alone? One? Never. Impossible. I can call Mendel to take a look. I'm sure Toby's right. Listen, George. I know Polyakov works for Moscow Centre. Of course I do. We all know. But come on. Think how many other operations we've run this way. We've bought Polyakov, right? He's a Moscow hood, but he's also our Joe. Now, he's got to pretend to his own people that he's spying on us. So we've got to give him one or two goodies now and again. Sure, I've passed him the odd sealed packet. Chicken feed. So he can send them home and Moscow sent a clap him on the back and tell him he's a big man. It happens all the time. Now, come on, George. You know the game. So are you Polyakov's agent inside the circus? Someone has to be. If Polyakov's cover for meeting you people is that he's spying on the circus, then he must have a man on the inside, mustn't he? Polyakov can't report back to Moscow center after he's picked up a great load of circus chicken feed and just say, I got this from the boys. He's got to have a whole history. How he selected his man, courted him, bought him. How they meet and where. The whole paraphernalia of running a double agent and all this in Moscow center's archive. You, Toby? Toby Esterhazy masquerades as a circus traitor in order to keep Polyakov in business. My hat, Toby. A dangerous job like that deserves a whole chest full of medals. You're on a damn long road, George. What happens to you if you never reach the other end? With Lacon and the minister behind me? Why become the little guy? Why not go for the big ones? Percy Allerline, Bill Hayden. Thought you were a big guy these days. You're the perfect choice, Toby. Resentful about slow promotion, sharp-witted, fond of money. With you as his agent, Polyakov has a cover story that really sits up and works. The big three give you the little sealed packets of chicken feed, and Moscow Center thinks you're all theirs. The only problem arises when it turns out you've been handing Polyakov the crown jewels and getting Russian chicken feed in return. 
If that's the case, Toby, you're going to need some good friends, like us. Gerald, of course, is a Russian mole. And he's pulled the circus inside out. But witchcraft material isn't chicken feed. It's the best. It was good at first. Listen, George, suppose you're wrong. Toby, who told you to muzzle Jerry Westerby? The same person who sent you down to Sarat with a thousand pounds for Jim Prito and the instruction, get lost? Speak up. Was it Percy? I think so. Maybe it was Bill, though. Well, listen, it was a big operation. Sometimes Roy. It never seemed to come straight from one. There was a committee. I took a lot of orders. You told Predo to forget about Tinker Taylor. Where did that come from? I never knew what that meant. Now, George, that's the truth. Poor Toby. Yes, I do see. What a dog's life you must have been leading, running between them all. George, if there's anything I can do of a practical nature, oh, you know me, George. My boys are pretty well trained. Now, if you want to borrow them, I'd have to speak to Lacon, of course, but uh, well, you'd expect that. All I want is for this thing to be cleared up, for the good of the circus. I want nothing for myself. Where's this safe house you keep exclusively for meeting Polyakov? Five lock gardens at Camden Town. You're going to be staying here for a night or two. Fawn will look after you. Fawn, you'll have to make appropriate explanations to the circus by telephone. You're having girl trouble or whatever sort of trouble you're in these days. Then there's your wife, of course. Sure, George, I can handle that. If he's any bother, Fawn, use your own discretion. Peter, I want you to watch my back. Will you do that for me? Look for one man, but look. We will join up the Sussex Gardens. Same as you, George. Just a feeling. 
someone, but I couldn't say for certain. I covered both of you right to the front door. If either of you did have company, he's cleverer than me. Let's be known. Do you have anyone particular in mind? Shall I go down to pavement level, take a sniff? Well, proceed. Yes. Right. Now, the minister has one major worry. In his own words, how much porcelain gets broken at the end of the day? Scandal he's talking about. If we unmask the mole, are the Russians going to cut their losses by telling the press of the world how they've made fools of us all this time? I think not. If you make your enemy look stupid, you lose the justification for taking him on. Yes, I've told him that, George. So isn't his mind at rest? He hopes there'll be nothing messy, George. Nothing that could provoke Moscow. But proceed. Heavens, yes. Clean the stables. Mm -hmm. Problem, flush out the mole. Method. We need to alarm him just sufficiently to make him call for a crash meeting with Polyakov at the safe house, a meeting Gerald the Mole needs all to himself, secret from the rest of the witchcraft magic circle. There are two of them, and Alaline. You've definitely cleared Esther Hazy. Oh, yes. Thank you. Carla really did bring off the perfect fix for a while. It would be beautiful in another context. Tinker Alaline. Taylor Hayden, Soldier Bland, Spot the Mole. Quite. Ways and means, George. Ricky Tower will go to Paris. He'll make use of the appropriate embassy facilities to send a signal to the head of London Station. Something, 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 which we'll now concoct. <laughs> will be have information vital to the safeguarding of the service request immediate meeting personal remember vital to the safeguarding of the service it's even true don't forget that no mistakes Ricky your head's on the block not the only one Peter Yesterday, as it did say, two full milk bottles 
And all's well and you may enter, yes? Yes, George, and that's the second time. Is it? Well, let's not pretend we're not nervous. Check, George. Ready? To record? Shall we try it? I'll go upstairs. What would you like? Monteverdi, I think Berlin. Mick Jagger. This machinery, installed at great expense to the British taxpayer, is voice activated. When I stop speaking, the tape will stop recording. See? Old man river, that old man river, he just keeps rolling. Hello, here's something. Soldiers just arriving. That's all three of them in there now. And to start his orders. Now, the important point is who gets away first. Just going for a walk. Back with you in a minute. All clear? As far as I can judge. No promises. I think you should come down now. Proceed? Proceed. What's that? Nothing. Just fiddling. Just leave it. Can't quite make him out. Hold a taxi right to the door. Cheeky. Thank you. Joints.
из наших встреч. Один не один. Просто с один евреем я. Будет ли это достаточно хорошо для Бланды? Демсио, что я достаточно убедительный для Бланды. А что хочешь выпить? Скотч. Bloody great big one. Have you anything on you that you would prefer I should... I go to bed. He's not. He'll play just long enough to keep his dignity. He can't jump the moment when he's on Chelsea. And he knows Tower would never stick his neck out. Something to buy back his good name. And then some. Carlos got 24 hours to get me out. How many cents? How many? Two hundred? Three? Four? Stop that! All right, all right! Are you armed, Bill? I'm a Soviet diplomat. This behavior... Shut up! Peter, will you please telephone Percy Allerline and ask him and Roy Bland to come here immediately? Then Lacon, then Toby Esterhazy. I think the first thing to do is to play them this evening's tapes. That should save a great deal of time in explanations. And if Kruchini? Alex, really? Oh, they're on. Do you mind if I finish my drink, George? There was no one out there you noticed. Quiet as the grave. Very proper, George. Don't want anything irrelevant, do we? Very tidy, George. Good Allie Line go to Paris. He's got to. He'll delay just long enough to keep his dignity. He can't jump the moment Ricky Tarr tells him to. But he knows Tarr would never stick his neck out like this unless he's got something precious. Something to buy back his good name. And then some. And you and I know what it is. Carla's got 24 hours to pull me out. The time has come, Alex. Well, that's that. Congratulations, George. Next step, gentlemen. Would you agree with me, Percy, that our best course is to make some positive use of Bill Hayden? We need to salvage whatever's left of the networks he's betrayed. Yes. We sell Bill to Moscow Center for as many of our men in the field as can be saved. For humanitarian reasons. Professionally, of course, they're finished. Quite. Then the sooner you open negotiations with Carla, the better. Well, you're a much better place to talk terms with our friend downstairs than I am. Polyakov remains your direct link with Carla. The only difference is this time you know it. It's definitely your job, Percy. You're still chief, officially. For the moment. Very well, George. Excuse me, sir. Uh, Mr. Gillum says, is it all right if the Inquisitors take Mr. Hayden away now? Shall I go first? Oh, 
all the best, Percy. I want Fawn to stay with me. I'm sorry about the assault. Unprofessional. It was just that it would have to be Bill Hayden, wouldn't it? He was always our hero, in capital letters. I mean, for the younger lot, my kind anyway. The antiquated English patriot. Never mind all the dirt we have to do, it's for England. The funny thing about all this, it's quite an effort now not to think of him with affection. I suppose Bill would say that means you've grown up, Peter. Always good for a laugh, wasn't he, Bill? I'd like to thank you, by the way. You helped enormously. No, truly, Peter. Lacon assures me there's been no coercion. I hope that's true. Oh, yes. No complaints, George. Bit of a nosebleed. Keep feeling dizzy. I'm sure it's just the excitement of it all. Why have you been weeping? Sheer exasperation. Really, the pettiness of our inquisitors. They're utterly incompetent. They actually believe I know the names of Carla's other moles around the world. Idiots. I can't talk to people like that. But you're prepared to say something to me, according to Lakeham. Can't Percy get a move on doing his horse trading with Carla? Oh, I'm sure it'll only be a matter of a day or two now. What do you want to know? Oh, 
Why? When? How? <laughs> you ask that? Because it was necessary. That's why. Someone had to. We were bluffed. You, me, Control, all of us. The circus talent spotters all those years ago, they picked us when we were golden with hope. Told us we were on our way to the Holy Grail. A lifetime of glory in front of us. Service to the great cause. Freedom's protectors. <laughs> what a question. Why? Do you know what's killing Western democracy, George? Greed and constipation, moral, political, ascetic. I hate America very deeply. The economic repression of the masses, institutionalized. Even Lenin couldn't foresee the extent of that. Britain Oh, dear. No viability whatever in world affairs. I suppose that's when it began. Turning my eyes to the East, I mean. When I saw how trivial we'd become as a nation. Say, mid-40s. By 1950, I was slipping Carla occasional gifts of intelligence carefully selected morsels to help the Russian cause against America. At that time, I was scrupulous not to give Moscow anything harmful to ourselves, our own agents in the field. I still believe the secret services are the only real expression of a nation's character. Until the mid-50s, I still had hopes, lingering loyalty to what we represented. Self-delusion, of course. We were already America's streetwalkers. I was granted Soviet citizenship 12 years ago. They've given me a couple of medals. What medals? I didn't ask him. Does it matter? Quite a lot to Bill, one supposes. Possibly. We're going to get a bit more from him, I hope. I do hope so, George. He's right about the state of affairs down there. Slovenly. They don't even patrol the perimeter, day or night. I have mentioned it. The thinking on Sarat is that it should be as inconspicuous as possible. I'm concerned for Hayden's safety. Aren't you being a little overdramatic? The only place he can go to is Russia, and we're sending him there anyway. The number of people who need to be told about all this, as we agree, must be kept as small as possible. I suppose your wife will have to be among them. I know you told me she and Hayden were over and done with now, as you said, but uh, there's always the unknown factor in matters of the heart, isn't there? I'm thinking about the future, any possible further contact, and if Anne doesn't know, she does meet so many different sorts of people. She gets around. I'm sorry, George. Not at all. I quite take your point. Anne must let us know of any approach, directly or indirectly, made by or on behalf of... Exactly. ...or even apparently on behalf of or merely concerning Bill Hayden. Thank you.
I was going to tell her anyway. You might call it balancing the books. Absolutely. You know, George, one thing perplexes me more than anything else about the mole conspiracy. Carla devised Operation Witchcraft primarily as a means of putting poor Percy Annaline on controlled throne. But why didn't Carla want Hayden to take over the circus himself? It surely would have been less difficult to arrange with all Bill's acknowledged accomplishments. No, no. We had the perfect setup. Percy made the running, I slipped stream behind him. Roy and Toby did the legwork. Far better for me to remain the freewheeling subordinate, the laughing cavalier. Being in charge could have bogged me down. Too much admin, diary full of meetings, dinners, chewing the cud in Whitehall. Never happened to control. A natural recluse control. I couldn't have behaved like that and got away with it. No, no, George. Carla and I agreed. I'd have been wasted as chief. Could have done it, of course. Of course. I'd like to go inside now. Yes, you're right. The Czechoslovakian business was a bit of a desperate throw. But something pretty bold was called for. I was certain control was getting very warm indeed. <laughs> All that burrowing in the files he was doing. It was paying off, I knew. He'd built up an uncomfortably impressive inventory of the number of operations I'd either blown or managed to cripple. And then, of course, he was narrowing his field of suspects. A short list of officers of a certain age, experience, rank. Mm. He did well, considering he was so ill. Surprised, Carla. Was the offer of information from General Stevchek genuine? Good Lord, no. It was a fix from start to finish. Stevchek existed, of course. Still does. Very distinguished man but he never offered anything to Control or anybody else. Did you expect Control to send Jim Prido? Well, obviously we needed to be certain Control would rise to the bait. We had to spell it out that he'd got to send a big gun to make the story stick. And we knew he'd only settle for someone outside London Station, someone he trusted. And someone who spoke Czech, of course. Naturally. It had to be a man who was old circus. To bring the temple down a bit. Yes, I see the logic of that. Oh, hell. It was perhaps the most famous partnership the circus ever had. You and Jim, back in the old days. The iron fist in the iron glove. Who was it who coined that? I got him home, didn't I? Yes. That was good of you. The thing with Anne was Carla's idea. Was it? Yes. Did you think it was hers? The point was, Carla always thought if there was a threat, it would come from you. He said you were quite good, but that you had this one weak spot Anne. 
It was a double fix, actually. On the one hand, you weren't likely to think of me as a circus spy if you were preoccupied with what your wife and I got up to in bed. And on the other, if it was well known around the place that I was her lover, it was bound to look like personal vengeance if you ever did suggest I might be the mole. So Carla said, not strain it, but if possible, join the queue. Point? Point. Presumably it was on Carla's instructions. You were with Anne on the night of the Predo shoot-up as insurance. Oh yes, he was adamant on that. They tell me I could be away tomorrow, or the day after at the latest. Can you make sure any mail gets forwarded from my club? Oh, and the balance of my salary, of course. I will. Anything else? Oh, yes. Nearly forgot. You got a pen somewhere? Thanks. Girlfriend. Give her this. I'm away on work of national importance. Maybe for years so she can forget me. And I can't take her with me, can I? Even if I could, she'd be a bloody millstone. Oh, and, um... There's one particular boy a cherub, but no angel. I haven't seen a lot of him. You better give him a couple of hundred. Can you do that out of the reptile fund? I would think so. Good. Oh, God, I'm tired. My pen, please. What? Oh. <laughs> Certainly. Sorry. Thank you. Don't look around, Bill. Oh, it's you, Jim. Come to say goodbye? Nice of you. I'm glad to see you haven't lost your touch. Must be in pretty good shape. Why did you get me back? I couldn't leave you rotting in a Czech prison. Russian. Why didn't Carla finish me off? Was that out of delicacy to you? Wasn't that, was it? You both thought that a corpse might create a lot more fuss than just another repatriated harmless cripple, didn't you? The shooting wasn't part of the plan, Jim. No, not the shooting. 
but everything else. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh, and in the eyes of all his servants. <coughs> and Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God hath shewed thee all this, for as much as Goth, God hath shewed, for as much as, for as much as God hath sh sh shewed, For as much as God hath showed thee all this. For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in It seems that at half past ten, Hayden told the guards he felt a bit sick and he thought a breath of air would help him. Because his case was now considered closed, they saw no reason to tear themselves away from some horror film that had just started on the television and they let him wander off. Half an hour later, they thought they'd better go and look for him. He'd received no letters, messages during the day. I was the only outsider to see him but his suit had come back from the cleaners. Possibly a message was concealed in it, inviting him to a rendezvous. The guards had not inspected the suit before giving it to him. I'm afraid that doesn't surprise me. Any comments, anyone? What if someone went to the cleaners, said he'd lost his ticket, and could he look through the stuff ready for collection? <clears throat> That's one way. Would the Russians kill him? It gives Carla all the reason he needs to cancel the deal on our networks. But Moscow Center prides itself on getting its people back. Important point, Roy. Well, who then? We will all, of course, have to account for our movements last night. Necessary formality. Also, Mendel, Fawn, Ricky Tarr. Then... As to the future, I've been asked to look after things for a while. I'd like everyone to take some leave. And afterwards, there'll be some redeployment. For those of you who wish to remain with the service.
just the same. You too? <laughs> no, um... Julian, was that his name? Jake. And no Jake. Gone. I actually got a job somewhere. I'm quite free at the moment. Enjoying it. Uncle Gazelgatz is away too, Madrid, so I've got the house all to myself. I brought you this. It goes, um... Oh, George. Very nice of you. Well, what's been happening? How have you all been? Did Bill say anything about me? I mean, me as a person, what he thought about me? Not really. Are you glad he's dead? Please, don't say not really. No, I'm not glad. There was a moment when I knew, when I heard his voice talking to Polyakov. Just for a moment, I wanted to shoot him. But it passed. Bill betrayed totally, didn't he? Everything, everyone. Was he taking some kind of revenge? He must have talked to you quite a lot. Should I have passed all that on to you? Pillow talk. Describe Bill. Yet another man trying to find a little place in history. Oh, but George. Bill standing at the center of some secret stage, playing world against world. He had a wonderful time. He enjoyed himself. He loved being a traitor. I'm glad he's dead. His life was over. I'm glad for him. Did you love him? Anne, did you? No, George. Poor George. Life's such a puzzle to you, isn't it?
Let's pause it, Robert. 